Okay, folks, uh, I will remind you that we uh, approved the agenda already and called the meeting to order and uh, went into camera for an item and have come back out, so we don't need to do any more of that, which puts us up on item number four, which is question period. Are there any questions of council at this point? Okay, Mr. Carter. Uh, I had uh, a couple of questions for Mr. Acton on uh, what he told me or gave me for Queen's Road. All right, the questions are to council, so then council. we'll, we'll okay. determine so. Uh, what I was, what the question I had is uh, over 10 years, it costs the same amount each time for a break. And I was wondering if the prices had never changed in 10 years or, or what? Okay, so I believe, Councillor Evans, you've worked through this a few times. We'll have Council Evans, who's the liaison counselor, to talk to that. Yes. Um, you were here last Monday? Yeah. Okay, he explained that we don't keep track of these figures explicitly, so what he did was he calculated roughly how much it would cost. This is an estimate, but it's the best we can do because we don't have this information. I went and asked uh, contractors. I asked four different contractors how much it would cost to fix an eight inch or a 10 inch water line. And they said between three and $5,000, not 15. Okay. But as, that's, yeah. and as, as I said at that meeting, and as I said uh, previously, um, you asked a question. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, uh, the town has no interest in knowing that answer. Uh, and the, the engineer got that information for you. If you have a question about that, um, you can ask another question. The fact that you don't agree with the figures or like the figures is, um, you know, people disagree all the time, so. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, the other one is the, we did uh, in 2017 and 2018, we did uh, $80,000 worth of road reconstruction on Queens Road. I was wondering where that was. Well, as you said, it was at the intersection of two other projects, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, well, yeah. with that, uh, who, was it, who was it paid to, the contractor? Uh, I believe the engineer came up with the cost of doing the work. So some of it would have been done by a contractor, some of it done by the town. He estimated the cost of doing the work. Like I said, you're the one who wanted this information. It's... Uh, it, uh, if you have another question, ask your question. But uh, the, the information has been presented to council, and as one councillor, I'm satisfied with what we got. And I've also said that I didn't think this was worth doing. I think the engineer has more important things to do with his times than answer questions because people are curious. Okay. Uh, did DTI, does DTI pay on the, the, the patching on Queen Road? Uh, I believe the answer is no, but I defer to the engineer. Well, I was told from DTI that they pay on all of Highway 106. So that's well, all. Uh, are you making a, if you have a question... Ask your question, but if you've heard stuff from other people... Well, all right. I, well, I have a question. Is that, that you're saying that DTI does not pay on any of the paving on Queens Road? No, no, hold on. You said patching. Patch, well, patching. Then, I'm well, there's a big difference. They, pay for the, they don't pay for the paving. It's my... Excuse me. When we do a reconstruction of the road and the whole thing is paved, my understanding is DTI pays for the pavement only. Everything else is paid for by us. Mr. Beal, I think you have some specifics on that. Yeah, when it comes to a complete uh, reconstruction project, uh, DTI will pay curb to curb. They will pay. Uh, prior to a few years ago, uh, prior to a few years ago, it was 100% paid for by DTI. Uh, now in Sackville, it's 85% paid for by DTI, and the municipality must contribute 15%. As far as the patching goes, uh, they do not pay a specific amount towards patching. Uh, they pay. They have rates that they have set. Uh, they do not negotiate with municipalities. It's per kilometer rate, and we receive a, a grant from the provincial government for winter and summer maintenance. 
Um, it goes to cover salt being put on the designated highways. It goes to pa paint patching on the designated highways. Uh, any repair and maintenance on the designated highways throughout the year. Um, we're trying to uh, justify through uh, through the UMNB that these rates that they're using are, are well too low and that they should be increased. Uh, so just last year we tried to start keeping track of what we uh, put for patching on designated highways in order to justify that. Uh, we still couldn't get a, an exact number, um, but we feel that they pay us $77,000. I think it's a little over eighty. dollars uh, in 2020, so it did go up a little bit in 2020, uh, but it's nowhere near the cost that we have to incur and put into the designated highways that we service. Yep. Okay. Uh, one other question that I have is bylaw uh, 272 that we had the reading on a month ago. We passed the first uh, the first reading on it. Uh, is that so that we are not allowed to ask more questions. That's what I get out of the out of reading it. That we're not allowed to ask questions. Which bylaw is he referring to? Do you know? He's the organization and procedures of council. Oh, the one that's coming up tonight. Um, I can't answer that. Is that the? I can. I can speak to it. Okay. So um, it says there may be a 15 minute question period at the beginning of the regular council meeting for purpose of clarifying matters of a minor nature or matters regarding the agenda. So it doesn't limit anything. The minor nature would be up to the chair to decide if a question that you were asking was uh, a good one to ask at that meeting or not. Okay. No. no that's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Shut me down when you want to. I'm uh, Mary Ellen Nurse, and um, I've been uh, sort of active in uh, getting to know politics in the last month or so because of the hospital issue. Um, I have a question for John I am the mayor, uh, d directly, uh, noting that uh, I believe it's your decision not to run next, uh, next term. How will your position as co-chair on our interim committee that was developed be effective, f affected? Is there going to be another person put in your stead? Are you, are you committed for the long haul as co-chair? No, I would not be. The co-chair is the mayor's position, so whoever is elected mayor would take that, that on. Okay, and with that, are you, are you uh, helping, uh, are, are you talking to other people about, um, about what's going on as in, in your position or how you're going, going to exit and bring that person on? Well, we won't know until there's an election if there's, unless there's only one candidate, but uh, I'm certainly keeping council abreast of, of all that we do. And there is a meeting for people who are interested in running for office on 24th. 24th. That should be an open house here where people who are interested can ask questions of any particular interest they have. So that I expect would be one. And this leads me to my next question. Well, how is uh, the focus of the what I consider for this town one of the most crucial issues is the uh, keeping of our hospital and the activities that surround it and the center of our town uh, focused during the campaign time that our councillors are out there going door to door. I mean, will the interim committee be stopped or be in hiatus until uh, that sort of campaign is over or is there plans to have a continuation of the a momentum that was created by the 500 or so of us that actually landed at the doorstep of the hospital. Yeah, so we are in the process of changing that interim committee to a steering committee in anticipation that it is going to be longer. And we are now in that process of setting that up. The uh, had a meeting with uh, the MLA last night about where she stood with the members that she had invited, which ones should stay, where else we should look at expanding. And uh, what I think is also a, an interesting feature is that the working groups are uh, volunteer groups that set their own agenda. They meet and are directed by some ideas through the steering committee, but they are deciding where they want to do the research and why, and then the communications group is deciding which pieces uh, should get out to the public, et cetera. So, That's correct. 
because that's the that's the recommendations I did give to Megan, so I'm glad she's implementing them. Um, but I want to know where we are on that. That leads me to my next question. Have all those committee members been picked? Have those subcommittee members been picked? What efforts are being made to incorporate people? As an example, I don't want to use his name particularly, but I'm going to, Greg Soper, who I know has offered uh, to be part of the interim committee. Uh, well-known practitioner who has been involved in many, many uh, things throughout the town and would be an amazing resource. I'm just wondering uh, who is picking these people, um, what the interim committee now is proposed of, and what the steering committee will be proposed of. I think as a town, and I'm going to keep harping on this, we need to know those things, or you're going to lose the momentum of the people who actually are more than prepared to roll up their sleeves and help you. And I speak to all the councillors. Right. I'm encouraging you by these questions to look and reflect on being a little more proactive with getting the knowledge out there. It's not, it's not easy to hear that there's been meetings or contra, con, convening meetings from a town councillor um, maybe the day of. Uh, we all are in this together. And if you don't think that and don't get the information out there, I can't say this, I can't say this any more harshly, you're going to lose the momentum of this town. Well, let me just at least respond to that. Thank one you. is that uh, one of the difficulties we've had, we're trying to maintain the same kind of uh, representation as set up in the public meeting, but we're now trying to turn it from an interim committee to a steering committee. So the same sort of structure that we were looking at is still in place. When we went to confirm some of those, we ran into a, uh, a high school break, which meant we lost people to be able to reply to their questions that we put out for about a week. So I've spoken or contacted four or five people today. Uh, I'm not prepared to put their names out it now because they have the right to say no. And well, if they... That's all I'm asking is... Is the intern committee in place or are you still considering people? We are considering people for the steering committee now. Uh, I don't know if I've been clear yet. The interim committee was what the MLA recommended be set up. And then... That was the 15-member committee? Correct. Okay. 12 to 15, 12 All to right. So it's moved now from the 15-member committee through negotiation and talking or whatever to now a steering committee, which now you are looking at the talent and the skills that can be brought to individual subcommittees working their own agendas. Uh, plus, we're trying to confirm who's going to sit on that steering committee. As we noted that several people were not around for a week or two and could not reply to the invitations. And when they are all accepted, then we also, because they are now under a, the town, we also have an obligation to get their approval to post their names. That's the RTIP issue when we do this. The previous one, which was done by the MLA, would not have had that same sort of requirement, but we do. Uh, we also have posted the first update from the commission, from the committee on the town's website, and I believe another one is going up tonight or tomorrow morning. And those are not directed by me or by the steering committee. Those are decided by the communications working group as to what they feel is the most appropriate thing to get out at that point. So this is really a town-driven committee. It's not, it's, it's a town council-driven committee. Well, then, then why must you follow the rules of the town? Because why, who, who's in charge is what, what I'm saying. Well, the, the co-chairs are the, the chief of Fort Folly and myself. Mm -hmm. And as we are part of the asking of who will, who will be on that steering committee, we believe we have an obligation to follow the rules that apply to the town for our participation in it. Thank you very much. Um, Last question, and, and I have two and one doesn't relate to this at all, but this is the last question of this one. Are we looking into other sources of hospital funding? Are, is there any focus on um, going a little rogue and moving ourselves out of, out of horizon, so to speak, and becoming the old town hospital that we were in the past? 
There has been that's, that suggestion by a few uh, people that have been involved. At this point, we're focused on two, three things, I think. One, that these are false arguments that have been made about why these are required. Two, that they have to stop pretending that that failed plan that they've tried to implement three or four times in the last five years has any basis of fact because we have asked for the data and cannot get it. And then three, we want an open health policy process that, that allows us to look at real data and to make some real informed decisions about health policy for all of the province, not just for the cities. Thank you very, very much. That's, to me, that's very, very helpful. We have that rural site that was started by, by an interested party, and it's, hard, it's difficult when that's the only way you can get your information if you're, if you're well, interested. So I'm to glad the... to hear it's on the town. The final question is, when I drive down Wellington Street, or when I even walk down Wellington Street to our beautiful new park, this is for the town engineer or people who put the parking lines up, uh, when you go down Wellington and you're going on to Lawrence Street, there's a parking lot for a car, a parking spot, right at the edge of Wellington Street. Mm. And when you are in a car, and this is the route that children take to school from Bridge, you cannot see unless you pull out behind, in front of that car that's parked there. My recommendation would be to remove the lines so that a car can't park right by that old uh, home hardware uh, okay. store. Mr. So. Acton's nodding his head, so I'd like him to reply to that. <laughs> that's an easy one, maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, in fact, uh, I had a, a discussion with one of the councillors on that, and I've noticed that myself, and when we do the line painting this year, that definitely will be changed because you're right, it is blocking the view of anybody seeing uh, up towards uh, Bridge Street. Yeah. Agree. Thank you for my first time, so this is great. I won't be here regularly, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, thank you. We move to uh, disclosure of interest. Are there any councillors with interests to disclose for tonight's agenda? Hearing none, we move to minutes of the previous ones. Page three, regular council meeting February 10th. Moved acceptance by Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Black. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Special meeting of council uh, of March the 2nd on page 11. Moved by Councillor O'Neill, seconded by Councillor Tower. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, we have no business arising from the minutes, um, unless anyone else does. I do not see it. Southeast Regional Services report, that's an easy one. There was no meeting in the past month. We have nothing to report from our side as board members and we can move to a planning report. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> in the month of February, there were two permits issued. Uh, this brought the total construction value to $285,000. This time last year, there were six permits issued but with a total construction value of $19,000. Um, that's mainly due to the nature of the types of applications that, that we've seen during those two time periods. <clears throat> the Planning Review and Adjustment Committee did not review any uh, applications for Sackville during the month of February. Um, other projects that were worked on was the GIS staff participated in the Climate Change Week sessions at the Tantramar High School, looking at some interactive mapping on uh, flood mapping in the town of Sackville and the, the region as a whole. Um, as well as uh, showcasing some of the uh, various climate change projects that have been going on over the years in the, the town by various groups as well. Um, the other thing I just wanted to highlight is again, we'll be having a drop-in session for uh, proposed flood mapping or updated flood mapping for the town of Sackville. Um, the date will be March 16th. It'll be held in council chambers here from 6.30 to 8.30. And it's an informal, kind of setting where uh, the public and council as well can drop in, look at the mapping, look at current what we have, as well as uh, other more updated uh, data that we have available as well. And that's it. Questions on the report? Councillor Evans, please. I'm just delighted to hear 
about that, I just want to ask a question. Is there, will there be a presentation or will there be people there with information? So there's a two hour period. Should you come at 6.30 to hear a presentation or stop by any time and ask questions? There, there is no formal presentation. Okay. All the information will be available. So yes, certainly don't feel that you have to get there at 6.30. We will answer straight through. And there will be multiple people. Myself will be there. I'm looking at uh, having one of our GIS staff as well as Jamie Burke will also be present. Any other questions? Hearing none. Okay. Um, so we will move to then our special guests in the audience. So uh, uh, we're going to read a proclamation for Mount East Day as we often do. So I'll start with that. So uh, on behalf of the town of Sackville, I'd like to welcome Andrew for uh, uh, to coming along with the women's volleyball team tonight, uh, council meeting as we <coughs> proclaim March 26, Mountie Day in the town of Sackville. One of the school's greatest success stories has been the Mount Allison women's volleyball team who finished as ACAA silver medalists this year. Jaden Bowles had eight kills for the Mounties to go along with seven for with Rachel McDougall. And this was the Mounties first visit to the ACAA championship game since winning the banner back in 2011. We're proud of all of the Mount Allison athletic programs, not only because of what you do on the court, field, or ice, but also because of the countless contributions you as individuals make to our community. Mount Allison athletes coach our kids, volunteer their times, help draw national attention to our town, and much, much more. And for that, and all of council, Sackville thanks you. So the proclamation is, Given the many outstanding accomplishments of Mount Allison Athletics, I hereby declaring March 26, 2020 as our sixth annual Mountie Day in recognition of the important contribution that Mount Allison Athletics makes to our community. In doing so, I encourage our council, our staff, and the entire Sackville community to show your support for Mount Allison Athletics on March 26 and wear your garnet and gold. Show your support in your home and business windows, and most of all, to continue to support the athletics and the various athletic programs at Mount Allison. To show our support, the Proud will proudly fly the Mount Allison Athletics flag on March 26th. Thank you. Andrew, would you like to make a couple of comments? Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, I'll bring some regrets from Pierre Arsenault, uh, Director of Athletics, and Head Coach Robbie Kraus for women's volleyball, who unfortunately are not able to attend tonight. Um, specifically women's volleyball, but uh, all varsity athletes at Mount Allison are very supportive of the support we receive from the town of Sackville in many ways. Um, certainly on March 26th, the Night of the Mounties, uh, we will be celebrating individual accomplishments as well as team accomplishments over the past season. And as you referenced, uh, certainly our squad had a very successful season this year, 13-5 and five record. And uh, uh, for those, and I believe there were a few in this room that did attend uh, portions of the playoff tournament that we hosted uh, just over a week ago, um, very thrilling uh, volleyball experience for all that were on the court and inside the gymnasium. And we were uh, very successful in uh, advancing to the championship final. So. It's been a very strong year for our sport, likewise with other sports. This past weekend, men's basketball team walked away with uh, the gold medal uh, championship title in ACAA men's basketball. Very successful season for certain members of the Mount Allison badminton team. Some individual accomplishments in the pool with Mount Allison swimming, as well as uh, the other fall field sports as well. So once again, we're quite uh, thrilled to be able to partner with the town, obviously, in everything we do on campus and in in uh, academic and student life as a whole. And I would encourage, you know, next uh, year, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with volleyball that much, we have a great indoor uh, sport to showcase um, and would uh, very much value and appreciate uh, this, uh, extra support throughout the season, not right at the end as well. So thanks again. Thank you, Andrew. I'd just like to make one, one last point, which is that we normally have a plaque that we do a, a photo op with you, but unfortunately the plaque hasn't arrived. 
So it is on its way, and we will make contact uh, when that arrives so that perhaps we could do it maybe on your turf that t instead of bringing you all back here. But we'll get a hold of you when that, when that comes in. And thank you all for coming tonight and for all you do to the community, for the community here. Thank you. The whole, whole <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, well, at least you can stay for this one because it's the mayor's report. Uh, uh, it is, uh, it's been quite a busy month. A um, few things going on. Lots of media attention due to the hospital. Um, and there are multiple uh, interviews done, including a national one with the CTV morning show. Uh, today, we also got a, uh, an interview, quick interview from Times Transcript over what our uh, budget wishes might be, like a Christmas wish for the budget tomorrow. So we'll see what they, they say about that. Um, few events. Uh, it's been a while. We've uh, talked about these things a few times in many forums, but it's been a while since uh, we actually did. I, I had a phone call with this Horizon CEO when she announced to us what the announcement was going to be later that day. We also held the community meeting at the, uh, at the hospital with her. Uh, we had the, both uh, the hospital process on February 13 and 17. Um, we did, uh, I also was consulted by uh, uh, the P3 organization, which is considering changing its mandate for economic development to something a little bit different, perhaps being larger in geographic extent, which is why we were included, because P3 really only meant to now Dieppe, Riverview, and Moncton. So they're considering a different approach to that, their mandate. Um, did spend some time. We had a transportation corridor study meeting on the, what we, we originally had been calling the Dykes study. It was made clear that it's a transportation corridor protection study, and we'll have more about that at some point. Uh, we did call our climate roundtable uh, together to talk about what the panel had heard and uh, what the mandate was for them in order to, uh, to fulfill it, and they are now working on some points and perhaps looking at some longer-term structures and have asked time in April to speak to the council on where that stands. Uh, also went to the uh, high school climate day um, prior to heading off somewhere. Um, DTI contact on a variety of things, including um, today, yesterday, we got a letter about the uh, approval of funds for the 506 proposal we put in last year for the highway, designated highway area, and that came through just today, I believe. Maybe might have come in on Friday, but Friday, and so... Uh, that is the project for this year. Um, ongoing contacts with the rural mayors on the hospital, uh, each of them each week, and it's still ongoing. And tomorrow we're meeting in Fredericton at, to hear the budget and perhaps have a few scrums with the media at that time. Loads of contacts with the MLA, particularly in the hospital, but on a variety of things. Um, we did the letter to the premier, which is now some time ago. It seems like old news. Uh, today we did get uh, copies of uh, francophone, four francophone communities who basically did the same thing we did except in French. Um, that came through today. Uh, we'll send it over to you. I was actually getting the communications group to look at it. Uh, the interim committee meeting has had a couple of times and as we described, we're now trying to turn that into a steering committee that can guide whatever working groups need to, to work. And we have active uh, groups on both communications and on research. And they're both uh, moving ahead on what they believe to be the highest priorities for each of those two. Uh, been a couple of contacts with UMNB on the, uh, on the resolutions we've had, um, both the resolutions for the budget that we made, uh, suggestions to the province in the, our resolutions for ways in which municipal finances could be made better, as well as the resolution on the hospital, uh, rural hospitals and, and uh, rural uh, health services. 
Aid Friendly Committee met uh, a couple of days ago just to kind of wrap up what the view was of how far they'd gotten in the three years they'd been here and what type of structure they would like to recommend to Council for proceeding with that. And we'll bring that back to you in the next little while when, when we sort out how they, um, how they would like best to do it. At this point, they are thinking about perhaps having a, a meeting with Council or else we'll just draft something up and circulate that. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet ADM of education on uh, education reform twice uh, on uh, what those topics might look like. Uh, it's active and we may have some more answers on, on how the province is prepared to do that at the budget tomorrow. Um, oh, and recently we got the, from the Department of Health, uh, the N New Brunswick's pandemic planning guide for local governments and First Nation communities and that has been shared and considered with our EMO and uh, we are well prepared as their request was to review the our EMO practices in light of what may be uh, a, an oper a challenge for an EMO purposes. So uh, I might ask, uh, later, actually are you willing, are you able to talk to that a little bit more at the moment? Okay, so I'll just ask the, the chief to talk about that. Thank you, Your Worship. So as you alluded to, the province has circulated an official planning guide for municipalities as of Friday morning, which that plan has been inserted into our EMO plan and has also been shared with all of management. Um, as per the provincial pandemic plan, the Department of Health has the lead on any health-related emergency and NBE, NBEMO assumes a supporting role with the Department of Health. Uh, we are in constant contact with the NBEMO, our coordinator and staff are working on a business continuity plan and we will continue to work what is best supports the health sector. Um, we will continue to work with the Department of Public Health and our regional EMO coordinator and just as of today I spoke with Phil Fontaine, Phil has alluded to that there is going to be a regional planning and advisory group meeting scheduled for this upcoming Thursday to include regions of Kent, Miramichi, and the southeastern corner of New Brunswick. At this point, meetings will be on a weekly basis. However, if it is needed, they will progress um, to what the demand is at that time. But at this time, it's on a weekly basis only. Okay. Uh, any council have a question on that? It's, it's important that we understand the, that we're ready and the procedures are in place. And health makes all of the calls about where, where we're at and then we, uh, we activate the EMO to play our roles. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, any questions on my report? Hearing none, we will move to the CAO report and uh, the CAO is unable to come tonight but the report is on page 17 and he basically has deferred the the specific reports to each of the areas that we'll be talking about tonight. And uh, I have been in direct contact with them on a regular basis, particularly in regard to the EMO and the, and the relationship as he is the senior EMO officer uh, in charge at that, uh, if that does come to, to a point where we have to implement it. Okay, so that's it for the Bayer's report. That's it for the CAO report. We'll move to finance and admin. And that's Councillor Tower. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the bills and payroll information is on page 18 and 19, and I'll ask the Treasurer if he has anything he wants to add for background. Thank you, Councillor Tower. Um, as far as the accounts payable report, uh, of course, we're progressing through year end, so a lot of the invoices that were paid in February relate to the month of January. Uh, in, in the general government, uh, the larger invoices were our works, annual WorkSafe New Brunswick payments, about 70000 uh, grants that were approved by Council, uh, normal garbage, uh, Southeast Regional Service Commission payments, uh, power bills and utility government, uh, it was power bills and our, our monthly Veolia payment. Uh, general capital included Lawrence Street Phase 2. Uh, page 19, which is our uh, salaries for the month, uh, there's two pays in the month of February. Uh, you will notice that overtime is, is relatively low, uh, but there was overtime involved. Uh, the report only indicates uh, what is paid out. 
uh, of course. So uh, within our collective agreement, they are allowed to bank up uh, up to a certain amount of hours the, at the start. Uh, at the start, and most do that at the beginning of the year. So uh, there were, was overtime relating to snow removal and other activities, uh, but that would have been banked. And uh, if it, they choose to pay it out in the future, it would get noted at that point in time. So even though snow removal, of course, uh, isn't listed there, there was overtime for snow removal. Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, my motion on that. I move that Council accept the bills and payroll for the month of February 2020 as follows. General Government, $367,315.56. General Capital, $76,760.80. Utility Government, $43,968.29. Utility capital, nothing at all. And salaries of $197,857.87. Moved by Councillor Towers, seconded by Deputy Mayor Aiken. Question? Question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Council okay, Tower. now the finance report. Your information is on pages uh, 20 through to 29. During uh, February, finance was busy preparing the necessary uh, work for the auditors. Uh, they were in uh, uh, last, uh, last week to begin their 2019 audit work and review the financial information. The financial statement are included at the end of December 2019 as of March 2nd, 2020, which represents the statement to be at nearly 100%. Uh, complete except for the final adjusting entries made by the auditors. You will see uh, from the attached reports that uh, this time we project a surplus in the general operating budget of approximately $63,677 and a surplus in the utility operating budget of approximately $9,136. This falls in line, of course, with previous years' surplus. Uh, and would need to be recorded as revenue for the uh, 2021 budget process. Once the numbers have been confirmed by the auditors, it will be uh, a detailed information presented. In accordance with the 2019 financial, mo a motion is going to be presented tonight to submit to the Municipal Finance Corporation our 2019 financing requirements for the 2019 budget and refinancing of prior uh, year's debentures will we require long-term borrowing of $340,000. This entire amount being financed is for utility capital projects, which include $205,000 in refinancing from a June 2010 debenture for the water tower that required borrowing over 20 years and the the initial term of the debenture was only issued for 10 years. Therefore, the further financing uh, of up to 10 years is required. Uh, $135,000 borrowing for the 2019 utility projects, whereby 452000 was spent, with the difference being paid through the gas tax funding and capital of revenue. So uh, saved a fair amount of cash. And, of course, the great note is there's no borrowing for the general capital for 2019. Finance statements are also included uh, there for uh, February, ending February 29th, 2020. Uh, and you can read that. And any questions, you, you know where we are. Our hearing with the Municipal uh, Capital Borrowing Board for, was on February 10th, 2020. The results of the, of the hearing were provided to us late February and all items applied for were approved. Water bills went out January 15, 2020 and had a due date of February 14, 2020. Uh, we will send out a reminder in March to all those who have not paid their bills. Lawrence Street Phase 2 had an additional claim of $308,009 which we received uh, from the province in early March. All funding for this 
including holdbacks, must be completed by March 31st, 2020, and we're working to complete that. Dog tags for 2020 will be on, are on sale uh, in Town Hall and have a due date of March 31st. Uh, rabies, uh, proof of rabies vaccination must be presented at that time of registration. After the 31st, if people want to be so generous, they can come in and, and give us an extra $20 for being late. Uh, we did send out a mail-out notice to all residents of Sackville during February to remind them to be in. And if there's no questions, I'll go on to the motion. Questions on the report? Hmm? Councillor Black, please. Um, well, a comment in question. Uh, it's wonderful to see and not unexpected that we're in good shape again for 2019. That's, that's excellent. Um, can you talk about the surpluses and what that means for the town? Mike or Mike? Mr. Beal, please. Yeah, um, each year we try to, uh, when we're coming into December, as you know, we, we look at our reserve fund amounts and uh, where we are and uh, try to put together an estimate uh, as to uh, where our financial position will be, knowing that we have nearly a month left uh, when we get to December. Um, so this year we, of course, uh, transferred uh, $225,000 out of the general capital reserve fund uh, in order to help pay for the expenses relating to Lawrence Street Phase 2. Uh, if you recall, early in the year we said uh, that we would be depleting the reserve funds entirely. Uh, we did not need to do that. I don't have the numbers uh, before me tonight, but those will be presented with the, with the audit and in the report uh, for that month. Um, but uh, the, the surpluses, uh, we, when we make those transfers, uh, we do try to maintain a surplus in the general in the fifty dollars to $100,000 range. Uh, of course, not knowing what's going to happen, I always try to leave a little extra cushion in case, uh, in case, things, uh, in case we do get a really bad uh, December full with snow and, uh, and or issues with, uh, with uh, other weather-related activities. Um, in the utility, it's a, it is a much tighter budget. Uh, General has $11 million versus utility of under $2 million. Um, so it, it is always much tighter to balance, but uh, we have maintained surpluses there. So what happens with those surpluses uh, is they get recorded as revenues for 2021 since they're 2019, second, second prior year surpluses. Uh, if we ended up the year with deficits, those would have to be recorded as expenses. So, of course, if they were if uh, if the reverse happened, then as soon as we start a budget process, we're behind in what we've got to come up with. So, uh, when we look at our reserve fund transfers in and out, uh, we do try to uh, maintain surplus at the end of the year, and that, that's why we uh, ended up transferring two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars out of out of the utility out of the general capital reserve fund in order to uh, cover the necessary expenses for uh, Lawrence Street Phase 2, with the remaining coming from savings that happened throughout the budget year. Thank you. Councillor Evans, please. Yeah, first of all, let me echo Councillor Black. It's always a treat to hear uh, a report that indicates what good financial shape we're in. I feel comfortable knowing you're at the helm. Uh, my question is, uh, at some point, let's just say we were, and it was alluded to earlier that we have we received funding for uh, from DTI for this year. Last year they they well, essentially didn't give us anything. Um, uh, this coming year they are going to fund the uh, 506 project. We also got another letter now is from the uh, the IBA. Is that going to be coming up, being addressed at some other point in the meeting, or can I ask you to share some news that isn't as good? Probably now is a good time. Now a good time? Okay. Um, have you seen that letter? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so we, we had applied for uh, infrastructure phase three uh, with the new infrastructure that was, uh, that was, uh, that was going on. Um, and uh, the letter came Friday, the same, uh, same day, same time as the, uh, as the Daisy Highway, indicating that we were not successful uh, in, uh, in obtaining any funding under the next round of infrastructure. Uh, that our application would be held uh, uh, for future. 
Um, we had applied, of course, for uh, phase three, which uh, would be uh, which would include additional ditching, additional retention bond. Um, the the letter did indicate that uh, that they did uh, with the limited funding that they had available, they were uh, concentrating strictly on water and sewer infrastructure, not uh, not wastewater or storm or, or sorry water and wastewater, but not stormwater uh, for this for this round. Uh, we know that during the provincial budget in 2019, 2020, and 2020, 2021, uh, that infrastructure funding was limited in there. Uh, so, of course, uh, with the uh, with the funding requirement, even if the feds were prepared to give more, and the province uh, the province had less, then the, ultimately it's whichever pool is the lowest will be it will be allocated. They have not announced which projects as of yet have been have been have received funding, uh, but had indicated that we would not for, for 2020. Uh, if we had have been successful, as indicated in the past, we would have had to apply for uh, for borrowing for our for our share. Uh, what this does does do, of course, it allows us to to potentially plan for this in the future. Uh, that if we are successful in year two or three in 2021 or 2022, uh, we can look at where our reserve funds are at that point in time. And if we are able to put more money into our reserve funds, just as we're doing with the utility capital for future sewage lagoon upgrades, uh, then we may be able to finance our portion uh, with all or uh, most of uh, of uh, reserve funds rather than having to borrow, which will of course continue. So. From a financial perspective, uh, it's potentially good that we did, didn't get it, but we could have fit it, as, as indicated in the past. But from an infrastructure project uh, uh, angle, we will continue to push towards uh, receiving funding for that, uh, the Sewage Lagoon, and other projects in the future. Uh, and this, this was the prediction that, of how it would come out when we went. Oh, I know. So it was only a $10 million that's right. from the province and that they had already said they were going after drinking water quality. Right. And I just want to say that we've been spoiled here. These new members of council, I think we've only had one funding request denied to us. It's a testament to how well our staff do presentations in terms of getting funding. So, um, but uh, the treasurer's point is a good one. If we had received a whole lot of money, we have to come up with our share of it. So I can understand why there is a there's a, a light side to this dark stuff, but we've been hugely successful in the past, so this is only fair. Mr. Black again, please. Um, I, I just had one more question. The um, uh, the generator, since that's a, a phased approach, and there obviously there's 100 percent of that um, budget available. How does that how does that work with you know, with the money remaining? Where does that where does that go? How does that? Yeah. So when we uh, when we did our reserve fund transfers in uh, in 2019. Uh, we had budgeted in 2019 uh, a, an amount to uh, 286 in 2019. Um, so no matter what was going to happen, we were leaving at least 286 into the capital reserve fund uh, in order for part one of the generator funding. So what we've budgeted in 2020 uh, of the additional amount of 289. Uh, so that uh, that money will be will be spent out of the 2020 capital budget, uh, and the total project, the remaining funds, will come out of our general capital reserve fund at the end of the year. Again, pending when we get to December, where our overall financial position is as far as revenues and expenditures go. Uh, potentially, uh, we would need to use the 286 that was left in there. Uh, but again, there is there is uh, uh, substantially more than the 286 that is left in there. Uh, I'm thinking it's a little over half a million. Uh, but I don't have that number right in front of me. It will be reported uh, potentially at the April uh, April report with the uh, with the audit if we're able to get that completed by then. Thank you. No other questions. Councilor Tar. Thank you, Worship. Just to finish up, we have the bylaws uh, enforcement report on page thirty. And you can see he's still being fairly busy, and somehow people still find ways to park on sidewalks. And uh, uh, it's, it's a good way to raise funds for the town, but I would think people would get tired of paying out the extra. Uh, also on page 31 is the animal controls report, uh, usual dogs and cats. But unfortunately, there's the, um, the usual stupid part in there that calls uh, dogs being left out in the cold weather. Uh, people haven't caught on that you know, pets are their responsibility and should show a bit more care and attention for them. So, and that will be my report. <laughs> Can't help it. Yeah. You have a motion, Councillor Tower? Uh, no questions on your report? Nope. 
no no motions on that. I did. Oh, that's right. I had, I should have done the report, <laughs> the motion before I did that. That's right. I got carried away. Uh, I move that the treasurer be authorized to issue and sell to New Brunswick Municipal Finance Corporation uh, a municipality of uh, to the municipality of Sackville, New Brunswick, a debenture in the principal amount of three hundred and forty thousand, on such terms and conditions as are recommended by the New Brunswick Municipal Finance Corporation, and be it resolved that the municipality of Sackville, New Brunswick, agrees to issue post-dated checks payable to the New Brunswick Municipal Finance Corporation and when they, when they request it, in payment of the principal and interest charges on the above debenture. Moved by Councillor Tower, seconded by Councillor Evans. Question? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you, Councillor Tower. I think that's it, is it? That is it, Next up is Tourism Business Development. Councillor Michaud, please. Thank you, Worship. The report appears on page 32 in the package, and I'll just uh, touch on a few highlights here. Um, the 2020 edition of Border Town is fast approaching, May 27th to 31st, and you can get more details at sackville.com slash bordertown. Uh, also, the department's hosting a subsidized food safety course on Tuesday, March 10th, and uh, you can register for that, sackville.com slash programs, or at Town Hall. Uh, the uh, public will be hosting public consultation sessions on updating the town's tourism strategy on March 31st and April 2nd, and uh, also you can refer to the sackville.com website uh, for more details on that. Manager, uh, the, ma the manager attended a development meeting about the proposed New Brunswick Department of um, Tourism, Heritage and Culture Ambassador Program. The program will be aimed at giving opportunities for more tourism training for organizations and frontline staff. As well, the manager attended a tourism town hall where representative of several national and regional tourism organizations, including the town or the Tourism Industry Association of Brunswick, presented on uh, services they provided. The um, town will be, will, or sorry, the town was uh, represented at the Mount Allison Open House on February 28th. As well, um, the department is pleased to present a web presence boot camp for business on March 18th at Bill Johnstone Fieldhouse for more information uh, please uh, visit sackville.com slash programs. Um, also, more online courses for local businesses will be announced soon. We continue to follow up on initiatives discussed with the provincial tourism representatives at our meeting about our VIC and other tourism initiatives. And I'll call on uh, Mr. Kelly Spurls to maybe speak a little bit further about how those meetings have gone with uh, provincial tourism and uh, what's happening, seeing how... Um, the tourist bureau was shut down and all that. So. Thank you, Councillor Misho, uh, your worship and other councillors. Um, yeah, we've had um, several uh, kind of uh, email discussions and uh, contacts from different people uh, in the in the uh, provincial tourism department. Um, some of the areas that we've touched on are uh, provincial the provincial travel trade representative. Travel trade is the uh, bus and group tours. Um, we've had some brief discussions with her and we're going to do more follow-up on uh, getting information about potential opportunities and how we can increase our readiness to attract that kind of business. Um, Tourism New Brunswick has also offered to provide us uh, a new tide board for our visitor centre. We have a, a board in the centre that lists the tides in uh, Hopewell Cape and, uh, and Shediac as well, so they've offered to, to upgrade that for us. Uh, new photos for the VIC. If you've been in, you may notice that... Um, we have some photos that I think are from maybe the 80s or maybe the 90s, but uh, we definitely could use an upgrade on those. They've offered to provide us new photos. Uh, they've offered to do a website review to look at our website and give us uh, suggestions for improvements we can make. And as I mentioned previously, um, they have offered uh, to, uh, or are open to the potential of helping us to revamp our total website uh, next year when we get to that project. Um, 
They've, uh, we have already organized a, a training session for Google My Business, so uh, helping businesses to use Google effectively, which is going to happen on June the 4th, and they are, they're coming here free of charge to present that workshop. And they've also offered uh, to give us some training for our staff, which would include um, some job shadowing of them and, them, uh, and then them coming here to give us some evaluation and feedback. And they're looking to do a few other things, uh, EV signage on our, our highway. Um, marketing and partnership opportunities are going to uh, give us some, some details about some of those that uh, may, we may be able to participate in. And they're also going to be sending their mobile uh, unit here. They have a, what they essentially call a mobile provincial VIC that goes around to different locations in the province, and it will be here at some point during the summer. And um, I, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but um, this, this uh, was really Jamie's accomplishment. Um, we mentioned that there were no flags on the flagpoles out on the uh, marsh, and uh, they have put them up on one set of flagpoles, and they've uh, told us they're looking into the other set of flagpoles, so we're pleased about that. So it's, it's an ongoing discussion, and uh, things are moving along, so thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, if there's no questions, I, I, Question. I do not have any uh, motions. Questions on the report? Uh, Councillor Black, please. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering if, if you could give a little more information on the ambassador program and the tourism town hall, uh, just what that means for Zachville or you or... That be directed... Oh, I'm sorry. At, at, directed at Councillor... Mr. Kelly Sparrows, please. Thank you, Councillor. Um, the ambassador program, it's... Uh, it's it, I can't take credit for inspiring it, but it's the sort of thing that we've been doing um, where they're looking at ways to... Um, reach the kind of frontline workers, so people who work in, in restaurants or bars or parks or um, anywhere where they might interact with tourists, and uh, trying to find some models for giving them training on uh, how to be more, uh, more effective with tourists, how to um, you know, entice them and encourage them to uh, stay in New Brunswick longer, to go to other places in New Brunswick, to participate in things in New Brunswick. So the meeting uh, involved, they invited, I think, probably 25 people from different parts of New Brunswick. And uh, it was a World Cafe sort of style. And we talked about, everybody talked about sort of different techniques that they use and uh, different areas where they thought that sort of uh, program could be used. So the, the next step is um, the province is going to put together, I, I believe they're going to put together some sort of draft ideas of how the program might work, and then they will have us back and they'll, they'll uh, and distribute them to other areas for feedback. Um, the other meeting I think you mentioned was the uh, meeting uh, of where there are different levels of tourism associations present. Yeah. Um, so this was a, a useful meeting. Uh, I, I, I didn't learn a lot of new information, but there was um, the Canadian, I don't, I don't know the exact name, but they're the organization that represents represents Indigenous tourism in Canada. Uh, their, uh, I think, executive director was there, and she gave a presentation on what they're doing. Um, the Tourism Association of uh, Canada had a representative there, and then, of course, Thai NB, our local, uh, or our, our uh, provincial representative, representative um, the Cultural Coast, which we uh, used to belong to and in, kind of encompasses our area, our nearby neighbours. So it was an information session. Um, there was some discussion about um, uh, 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 potential uh, uh, resources that might be available to people who are looking to uh, learn more about tourism or develop their businesses more. Thank you. Hmm. Councillor Evans, please. Yeah, I just wanted to call attention to the uh, last item in the report about the land and sea episode that was done featuring the Christmas bird count. Um, I had received this from someone who had watched it, I guess, when it was live. and. Uh, I watched the episode and it was really impressive. The, it was really well done and it featured Sackville uh, very flatteringly. And uh, it's really nice always on television to see something familiar and it's not you know people protesting but it's actually celebrating something that's really attractive. So I thought that'd be a wonderful way to promote uh, quality of life in Sackville. So that was a real feather in our cap. So to speak. <laughs> Any other questions on the report? Oh, Councillor Tar. Yeah, Ron, uh, just wonder, this food, uh, subsidized food safety course, we've been doing it for two or three years now, I believe. Is that the one we've done before? Um, yes, it's, uh, it's the same uh, program that we've done before, where we, we pay half of the cost of it for uh, residents or people who work in local businesses, and then the people who come from outside pay the full cost for themselves, of course. So, it's quite um, I'm just curious how many people have uh, signed up for it this year as opposed to past years. Um, as of right now, we have 19 people signed up. 
Uh, the most we can take is 25, so it's, it's, that's quite a good number. Um, this is more than the previous time we did it. Um, it, it partly, it's one of these courses that uh, in, in, in a funny, well, I mean, I should expect, but it, it somewhat depends on the time of year. So right now we have uh, students and people preparing for the summer season. So uh, people are taking it so they can work in places in the summer. Um, but uh, it, I believe that all except for maybe one person are local as well. So. No other. Thank you, Councillor Michaud. We move on to uh, public properties and facilities. Is that Councillor Evans? Due to extreme fluctuation in weather conditions over the last couple of months, the Public Works Department has had to deal with yet another water main break, this one on Coronation Avenue. The Engineering Department continued to work with Crandall Engineering Limited and Beale and Inch Construction on the final tender of Phase 2 of the Lawrence Street project. The contractor has now completed the project with the exception of the security fence and final hookup of the pump, which will be completed in the spring. The engineering department has issued a tender for the 2020 street asphalt patching during the month of February. The tender closed February 21st with five tender bids received. Lowest tender was from McDonald Paving and a motion will be coming forward later. The Engineering Public Works Department has completed the evaluation of all municipal streets utilizing the town's asset management system and a 2018 RV Anderson Municipal Infrastructure Requirements Report to establish the recommended streets for the 2020 asphalt paving of various streets under gas tax funding program. This information was presented to Council last week for their review and consideration. A motion will be coming forward again later tonight. Engineering Department has continued to work with Liberty Utilities, formerly Enbridge Gas New Brunswick, on an updated draft agreement between the town of Sackville and the new owners, Liberty Utilities. However, due to the complexity of this agreement and the large number of municipalities involved in this process, the draft agreement has not yet been received. Therefore, another extension of the existing agreement is required. And a motion, again, will be coming forward after this report. The engineering department continues to work with Mount Alice University and the town's legal representative on a draft agreement between the town and Mount A with respect to the approval to operate Mount A's water distribution system under the town's current approval to operate certification. The engineering department presented general information on the proposed agreement to council last week at the special council meeting in anticipation that the agreement, the draft agreement will be presented to council perhaps at the April special council meeting for their review and consideration. From the Tantramar Veterans Memorial Civic Center, the Titan boys are up two games in their best of five playoff series and are hosting playoff game on March 10th. Puck drops at 6 p.m. Come out and cheer on the Titans as they vie for yet another provincial championship. Staff have booked a hockey tournament for April 3rd to 5th. The AAA Easter Coast Ice will be hosting different age groups for this tournament. They will also be providing two hours a night for practice for these teams between March 30th and April 2nd. Town Programming Department will be organizing another four-on-four -four hockey challenge between March 24th and March 29th. Contact the Programming Department for details. For the most part, all of the groups are winding down for the season. The ice plant will be shut down on April 5th. Programming Department will be hosting a registration fair on April 9th. This is a new opportunity for community groups to come out and show the public what their group has to offer, take registrations for the upcoming sections or seasons. And in park news, staff have been working on several capital projects for the 2020 year, with the following projects being presented to Council for their review and consideration during the special Council meeting last week. The accessible dock section for the Lillis Fawcett Park, new dugouts and backstop for the ball field, bunker gear protection for the fire department, as well as the purchase of five cast iron flower pots under the town's beautification budget. These motions will be brought forward later this evening. The deadline has passed for student job applications and staff are currently evaluating these applications who will be interviewing over the next couple of weeks. Questions on the report? Councillor Black, please. Um, I, the way this is written, it, it says the Public Works Department has had to deal with another water main break on Coronation during the month of February. Does that mean oh. that there's been more than one on Coronation? No. Or that more there than are... One water main break 
Okay. This one, that's why I read it that way, okay. not the way it was written. And when you read it that way, I thought maybe, yeah. okay. So I, I was going to say if there was more than one, then what's the solution there, or is there, is there a greater problem? Than, um, okay, uh, just one other question. Um, with the Civic Center, can, um, do you have any more information on the registration fair? Like, like, Sports fair. What, what, what exactly is that, or can you, can you talk more about that? or? So it's a sport fair. There's more coming in the uh, programming from the board. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? We have some motions. I move that council award tender number 2020-03 street asphalt patching to the lowest bidder, McDonald Paving and Construction, a division of Miller Paving Limited, in the reduced amount of $299,000 HST included. Moved by Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Black. Question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Councillor Evans. I move that Council approve the breakdown for the 2020 gas tax, ref, uh, gas tax fund for paving projects in the amount of $405,085, with the following streets and estimated distances to be completed. Walker Road, 300 meters, $50,000. Milner Avenue, base and seal coat, 105 meters, $50,000. Ogden Mill Road, phase two, 250 meters, $40,000. Rye Lane, 60 meters, $15,000. Star Avenue, 160 meters, $40,000. School Lane, 180 meters, $23,000. Uphill Drive, 200 meters, $30,000. Crescent Street, Phase 1, 300 meters, $50,000. Meadow Lane, base only, 190 meters, $54,000. For a total including HST of $404,800. Moved by Councillor Evans. Seconded by Councillor Tower. Councillor Finney, please. Dwayne, could you tell me exactly, uh, it says here, Ogden Mill Road, Phase 2. How many phases are going to be on that road? Uh, thank you, Councillor Finney. Um, I believe there's at least four phases, so still additional two phases to come. Again, it depends on the funding that we get and, and how many meters we're able to do in, in a particular phase, but at least two to three phases will be still to come. And the uh, Crescent Street phase one, how many phases will be for that one? Yeah, uh, yeah we've, we've got it tag, tag, tagged at three phases right now. Other questions, comments? Questions. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Okay. Mr. Robbins again. I move that Council authorize the Mayor and Clerk to sign and seal the extension agreement, again, of the existing contract with Liberty Utilities Gas New Brunswick, formerly Enbridge Gas, until August 31st, 2020. Moved by Councilor Evans, seconded by Councilor O'Neill. Question? Question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. I move that Council approve the supply and installation of the accessibility dock at the Lillis Fawcett Park to Santra Jique Dock. Oh, I guess 134. Yeah. Yep. In the amount of $17,393.75 HST included. Moved by Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Michaud. Question? Question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Councillor Evans again. I move that Council approve the quote for the proposed work to remove and install new dugouts and backstop to Dean Welling and Sons in the amount of $23,925.22 HST included. Moved by Councillor Evans. Seconded by Councillor Butcher. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. I move that Council approve the purchase of five cast iron flower pots with sackville in raised white lettering from Black River Casting in the amount of $12,937.50, HST included. Moved by Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor O'Neill. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Motion is carried. And finally, I move that Council approve the work to Black and McDonald for the supply and installation of a gutter system that will protect the bunker gear from glycol leaks in the amount of $7,402.55, HST included. Moved by Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Tower. Question? Question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Recreation programs and events. Councillor O'Neill, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, all winter programs uh, continue, of course, and there are several new programs being offered in the coming months, which include kids' multi sport, youth rugby, Marsh View Spring Trailblazers, and adult sewing. Uh, the department has been approved for funding through the Future Ready New Brunswick program to hire a co coordinator student this summer to evaluate town programs from a climate lens, organize a street chalk festival, and host various educational and recreational opportunities for our residents. Our first recreation and sports fair is scheduled to take place on April the 9th from 6 uh, to 8 p.m. at the Tanimer Vet Veterans Memorial Civic Center. Uh, this is a free event which will showcase case all of the various, various of all age opportunities available in our town, from art to sport and from music to physical activity. Sounds like it'll be an interesting evening. The Sackville Sports Wall of Fame Board of Directors is pleased to announce the 2020 inductees, golfer Ruthie Maxwell and Taekwondo athlete Alan Snowden. Our March break activities kept everybody, I think, busy during this past week. An annual Mounty Day will take place on March the 25th, and we're encouraged to uh, put on your garnet and gold and join the town uh, at 11 a.m. here at the town hall for a flag raising and speeches and cake. The 4x4 Hockey Challenge is scheduled for March the 24th to the 29th and is now open for registration. Uh, quarterly, the second quarterly mail out highlighting the various workshops and programs offered by the town from April 1st to June 30th will be mailed to all Sackville households in mid-March. The department will be presenting half-day sessions on conflict resolutions in the workplace on March the 10th at the Civic Center. And of course, all of these, uh, you can find more information by visiting the www.sackville.com. The department will be presenting an evening session on anti-inflammatory eating on April the 1st from 7 to 8 at the Bill Johnson Memorial Park. And you have to register for that program at the um, web. Work is also already underway on the 20th Fall Fair. Agreements have been finalized for the Ray Oliver Band to open for Jimmy Rankin on September the 26th. Family Day at the Doncaster Farm will be back as well as, as will the Mid Midway. And a full, a full list of Fall Fair motions will be presented in the April Special Council meeting. And that is that. Now we go on with the library report. Uh, the library has been busy clearing out much of their old inventory, which was overcrowding their shelves. We had 1,302 people visit the library in February, and uh, the Ralph Howe meeting room was used six times. Regular programs continued with the assistance of casual staff. Highlights include the adult book club, drop-in family time, and a th Thursday morning story time. Board Chair Karen Bramford is on a six-month sabbatical, so Meryl Fullerton is acting chair during this time. And the Library Board applied for a Canada Summer Job Grant to hire a summer student. That's my report. Councillor Black, please. Um, I had a, a couple of questions. Uh, what is kids' multi-sport? Uh, thank you, Councillor. The, the idea is to offer a different sport each week for six to eight weeks. Um, the sports will be uh, opportunities that are accessible in town but are a little less traditional, so martial arts, ultimate frisbee, 
uh, training to swim, things like that, rugby. Um, so we've already been in touch with a few different organizations about setting up dates and times for that. So the full information should be available pretty soon. Uh, Councillor uh, Evans? Oh. Yes. Oh, oh. oh, sorry, you have another? Just one more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Bill. Um, the, oh, i got to find myself. The, the Climate Change Awareness Coordinator position, um, I looked at the Future Ready NB website, and was this a position they were suggesting, or was this one that the town had created? And is there anything else you can say about the job description other than what's in the report? Yeah, it was, uh, well, we, we were made aware of the opportunity to apply for the Future Ready program, but the position itself was something that we thought of internally. Um, it, it aligned with another grant that may become available through the Parks and Recreation, Canadian Parks and Recreation Association. Uh, and then we knew that with the mayor's um, roundtable on climate change that there could be projects coming up pretty soon. Um, so th this person's job will primarily be to organize different educational and recreational opportunities uh, using a through a climate lens, evaluating our current opportunities that exist, doing some policy work internally, and, and organizing the Street Chalk Festival that'll have a climate-related theme. One more? Well, just a comment, a proactive approach to hiring students for the summer. That's fantastic. Good work. Right. Uh, Councillor Evans, I think you were next. Yeah. Um, Really impressed with this report. There's a lot of good stuff in here, and uh, so much so that there's one little line that says, our March break activities took place between March 2nd and March 8th. That's a pretty simple statement. A lot of stuff happened that was included in that, and I spoke to a couple of parents of young kids who were really appreciative of some of the stuff that was organized, so I just want to say kudos to you for this and for all the other stuff identified in this report. Thank you. Councillor Finney. Um, Mr. Pride, I just wondered, the library, you said, has cleaned out their inventory. What do they do with it? Uh, that's a good question, Councillor. I'm, I'm not totally sure. I know that the, uh, the province comes in and they, they have, they had an access, an, an excessive amount of inventory. So the uh, provincial folks come in and help them determine what's still relevant and what's dated and that sort of thing, but I'm not sure what they do with their, their old inventory. Is there any possibility that some of these books, because of what, maybe because of the kind they are, could be sent overseas to countries that could use reading material? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll ask the librarian for sure. That's a good idea. One more. Councilor Finney? Yep, you're, oops, you're on. I'm on red. You're on. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, the coordinator the climate change coordinator. Has that person already been picked? Yeah, we uh, offered the position uh, late last week to uh, Mount A student, uh, Brianna McLeod. Environmental Studies Program under Michael Fox. Yeah, I have to double check that to be sure because we did interview a few people, but, and I know some of them were, but not all of them, so I'll, I can double check. Would she also be doing the thing with the Chalk Festival as well? So it's not the same girl as last year. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Um, no motions? You're good, none? No motions, Your Worship. Okay, so we move to public safety. Who's first? Are you first, Councillor O'Neill? No. Councillor Butcher is first. Thank you. Uh, the report can be found on page, oh my eyes, 39, starting on page 39. Um, we met on February the 18th. Uh, liaison counselors and Chief Bowser met for the fire portion. Um, just before I tell about all the calls that fire and rescue responded to in the month of February, you know, anybody who thinks that our fire department just fights fires is 
really wrong. There were 17 calls for service in the month of February, and they included five motor vehicle collisions, two commercial fire alarms, two structure fires, two vehicle fires, two requests for assistance from Ambulance NB, one smell of propane, one water in a basement, one smoke in a residence, and one residential fire alarm. Those were up by two calls compared with the same time frame in uh, 2019. And training sessions that took place in the month of February were the self-contained breathing apparatus, accountability system and pump operations, and the members also conducted station and equipment checks to ensure that all equipment remains in a state of readiness. Uh, as everyone knows, the 111th annual Firemen's Winter Carnival was held on Saturday, February 8th. And the members of the Sackville Fire and Rescue would like to thank all the local businesses and business owners for their donations. Um, it couldn't be done without them. And they would also like to thank the judges, Sean and Sherry Smart from Tantramar Electric, and Darren and Crystal Duncan from Brunswick Fire and Safety. And last but not least, we'd like to thank the residents of Sackville and the surrounding community for all their support year after year, for 111 years, to make this a great community event. Um, on Sunday, March 8th, our clocks went ahead by one hour. I'm sure anyone who has small children or works with small children is well aware of that right now. Um, but that said, once you get over the trauma of that, remember it's a really good time to check your smoke alarms to change the batteries in them. Um, and our 15th annual truck draw tickets are out. So make sure that you pick up your ticket from any firefighter and you can make use of the coupons that are attached to the ticket stub. And as always, we would like to remind residents of Sackville to make sure they have a basic emergency kit prepared to last 72 hours. Um, now we're starting to hear that perhaps we should be ready for a little longer, just in case with COVID-19. Um, the fire chief uh, wants to remind us that there should be two liters of water per person per day, food that won't spoil, such as canned food and energy bars and dried foods. Um, and to remember to have a can opener and a flashlight and batteries and a first aid kit. Um, Facebook also tells me that you should make sure you have toilet paper. And uh, that is my portion of the report. Questions on that portion? None. Councillor O'Neill, please. Thank you, Your Worship. My report's on page 40. It has to do with the police services. February 2020, the local department uh, detachment responded to 99 calls, which was significantly lower than last month and last year. This is primarily due to lower property crimes being reported. Police are still advising the community to be cautious, cautious in relation to email and especially phone scams. There are still people being victimized and vulnerable seniors are often targeted. Overall, though, no crime, ten, no crime trends were noted. Related to traffic operations, three impaired drivers were arrested, three suspended drivers were detected and charged, and nine speeding tickets were handed out. Police continued speed enforcement efforts in certain areas of town. A number of check stops were also organized. Starting March the 3rd, the RCMP in New Brunswick is utilizing a knee ticketing system which will facilitate the data collection of tickets written in an almost exclusive electronic format. It's expected that statistics on these charges will be more available for a variety of purposes. And from what I understand, this will help them if somebody has collected tickets over a period of time. Uh, instead of the RCMP thinking maybe, well, this is just once he's been caught, he or she has been caught for speeding, <laughs> that it would show up that maybe they had already been caught two or three times previous to that. So, In the administration, there are currently some changes to the detachment staffing. Three members are in the process leaving and prom promptly being replaced. These transitions are expected to be completed by next May. And that's my report, Your Worship. Questions on the police portion? No. We, if that's good for public safety, then we move on to item H, policy bylaw. Councillor Black, please. Uh, the policy and bylaw report can be found on page 41 and 42 of the package. Uh, the policy bylaw liaison group met on February 17th, uh, 2020. 
with a request from local businesses being received regarding two hour parking downtown, bylaw number 262, the street traffic bylaw, uh, two hour parking was reviewed. The recommended changes would be to have the Saturday restrictions removed from the bylaw. Motions to give first and second reading uh, to that bylaw will be coming this evening. Bylaw number 271, a bylaw relating to establishing a code of conduct for elected officials, received first reading at the February regular council meeting uh, and has been advertised on the town's website and a motion will follow uh, for second and third readings this evening. Bylaw number 272, a bylaw respecting the procedures and organization of council, received first reading at the February council meeting. Bylaw number 272 has been advertised as well on the town's website and a motion will follow again this evening for second and third readings to that bylaw. The clerk's office attended the opening for tender number 2020-03, uh, the street asphalt patching on February 21st and five tenders were picked up as we heard this evening. Um, and a motion was brought forward uh, to award that to McDonald Paving in Moncton, New Brunswick. Request for quotation was sent out to uh, Centre de Cai, Quay, Cai, Dock Shop, uh, 134 Easy Dock for the accessible dock section of the existing docking system. And a motion was brought forward and passed this evening. Requests for quotations were sent out to two qualified contractors for the improvements to the ball field dugouts and backstop. Uh, quotations were received from Eastern Fence Limited and Dean Welling and Son. And a motion was passed this evening to award that to Dean Welling and Son. Request for quotation was sent out to Black and McDonald for the recommended glycol gutter system that would capture glycol leaks in the fire department bay. A quotation was received uh, by Black and McDonald and that motion was passed this evening as well. Request for quotation was sent out to Black River Casting Limited for the five cast iron planters that will replace several wooden flower boxes in town. A quotation was received in the amount of 12,937 and a motion again was passed this evening um, to award it to Black River Casting Limited. And I do have some motions, and if there are any questions. Seeing none. Ready? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I move that Council give second reading section by section to bylaw number 271, a bylaw relating to establishing a code of conduct for members of Council. Public notice is hereby given that the Town Council of the Town of Sackville proposes to enact the following bylaws. Bylaw number 271, a bylaw relating to the establishing a code of conduct for elected officials. Short title, definitions, purpose and application, framework and interpretation, statement of principles and values, Council responsibilities, members' responsibilities, respect for decision-making process, conduct respecting town employees, use of communication tools, use of social media, government relationship, conflict of interest avoidance, compliance with this code of conduct, statement of commitment, and effective date. Moved by Councillor Black. Seconded by Councillor Evans. Councillor Misha, please. Thank you, Worship. Um, under the, this uh, code of conduct, there's um, some information I provided in regards to possibly uh, making some um, adjustments or uh, suggested uh, amendments to to this. Um, and I know we had talked about it last month, and. Um, I guess at this point, I'd just like to mention the areas of, of um, amendments I'd like to see approached, uh, if, if Council would like to speak on those. Uh, under Statement of Principle and Values, uh, 9C, it currently states, observe the highest standard of ethical conduct and perform their duties in office and arrange their private affairs in a manner which promotes public confidence and will bear close public scrutiny. Um, the clarification around and arrange their private affairs um, um, seems to be kind of gray. And um, I'm just looking for or suggesting that and arrange their private affairs be um, stricken from that component. I'm not quite sure what it adds to the, the power of that um, statement, but um, there seems to be some gray area there. Now, I'm not sure if you wanted to talk about those as I go or if you wanted me to go through them all or 
how we want to proceed. Point of order. Yes. Uh, we're debating a motion. You can uh, move to amend it, or you can debate it. What's that? He's in the process of going that way. Well, I haven't heard an amendment. He's. He, well, he did. Well, he's trying to let you know what that is. Well, I'm aware of it. I'm expecting it. I'm just yeah, saying. He said he must make an amendment and have any part of it stricken from. So he has to. He has to make. A, you have to make a motion. A motion. And that's what I'm suggesting. Table it now. Yeah. So, do, would you like to make a motion well, and bring I, those, I, those I through? Asked, I asked for that clarification. Prior to the meeting, I asked for the clarification in regards to what the process would be and was advised that um, we would be discussing this as was indicated in February. Uh, I did ask in regards to if a motion, if I, how to prepare that motion. So um, the information I got back indicated that we were going to, to uh, discuss this under the question. Um, however, I can make this a motion um, um, if, okay. if need be. So. Do you mind to you want to speak on that, please? Thank you. Um, I believe that uh, any changes that um, are brought forward could be debated under the question of the motion. So under the question of the actual motion that's on the table right now. Okay. 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 Thanks for clarifying that. Okay. So you have a question so, on the private. So it's just. And yeah, so I, I guess probably as I go, do we just debate tackle each section? <laughs> debate each section, or would you like me to to just speak to the, um, the other amendments? Okay, Councillor Black, please. Um, I, I, the reason, I mean, this is my thought, the reason that and arrange their private affairs um, is because if it if this is stricken, then observing the highest standards of ethical conduct and perform their duties in office. So as a, as a counselor, I, I can never take that hat off. So for me to uh, be held accountable for my actions in office and outside uh, of this room, uh, I think is important. And I, and this is what this says. Yes, it's a little, uh, maybe a little fluffy, but basically it, it's, legal jargon, but it means in, in, your, in your life, outside of the office, um, you should be kind of holding yourself to those same standards that you would in your position in this room. That's, that, that's fine. I'm just looking for counsel's, I guess, that's feedback clear. on that and clarity on that. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the the other one was uh, release of confidential information prohibited. Um, currently, it states no member shall disclose or release to any member of the public any confidential information acquired to, by virtue of their office in either oral or written form, except when required by law or authorized by the town to do so. Um, just some areas that I think I had brought up previously is the fact of uh, where it's kind of not indicated that uh, the the, pro the item be marked confidential. I think it's important to that that be indicated so that there's clear direction when that information is provided, that council is made aware um, that this is confidential. Um, also, as a councillor, I'm accountable to council. So as opposed to authorized by the town, I would suggest maybe it should be authorized by council. So my suggestion would be that no, no member shall disclose or, or release to any member of the public any and um, strike confidential. Uh, so public any information and had marked confidential acquired by virtue of, this, of their office. Um, I, I think that in either or, uh, oral or written form should be stricken because Policing that could end up taking one person's time extremely um, and, and go on by saying accept when required by law or authorized by council to do so. So those would be my suggested amendments and I'm just looking for. Okay, well, uh, I'll respond to that. I think that the difficulty of, of 
if it has to be marked, there are, there are in-camera meetings that have discuss, discussion that goes back and forth, and the, none of that is marked, or, but that still remains confidential. So that would be a difficulty of, of saying that it will only apply to that which is marked. Um, so anything in camera maintains that confidential element. Uh, so that what I, I'm a little concerned about. And your second part there of uh, uh, the town, it should be the council authorizes, yes, it should be uh, appropriate authorization by council. Something like to wording to that effect, I would think. Is there a reason not? Or is the town considered the corporate town? Well, I was, I was actually going to comment on the first part of that, but um, I, yeah, I, I think you're right um, that he, he was, well, Councillor Misha is accountable to council, but the, the town is the corporation, I think is what it, what it means in, in that context. But um, I, I just wanted to say about the acquired by virtue of their office. Uh, so if you were as being a counselor and if you were downtown and a citizen approached you and said, look, I have this issue and it was something uh, that they, that was seemed like it was confidential, then they're not going to tell you that, you know, Hey, keep this to yourself. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But um, so acquired by virtue of their office, if you're a counselor, it's not just your business in here, it's to your to the citizens as well. So there's a confidentiality in that as well. Um, it's not just what's, again, in this room, it's what you hear out on the street. And so to police it as being marked confidential, again, in that case is difficult. Um, so in terms of the marked, that's the, I, what about the, the second part, which was uh, authorization? Well, I, I, I I, I think we yeah I think council speaks for the for the town um, I guess the capital T uh, so I, I think that the way that it's written is is fine um, maybe there's a difference of opinion there but in my, in my opinion the way that it's written seems to be acceptable I I, I want to say one more thing I might, okay I just want to make sure I was on um, the confidentiality thing is difficult and. A, a lot of that is your own judgment, and and I, I know that that not, not everything can be written out, and uh, for every situation that you might come across with with confidentiality, but I guess you just you have to use your best judgment um, and follow whatever rules are are there. But there's going to be lots of times where somebody may say something to you that like, you'll have to just make that decision whether it should be confidential or not, or somebody writes something to you, and again whether it should be held in strict confidence or not. That's tough, but. Okay. Go on to the next one. Um, just uh, and just some uh, point of clarification. Uh, I've brought up the use of communication tools before and, and have had a chance to read through that section again and discussed it here with uh, Councillor Tower as well. And um, I just want to clarify that um, when it comes to communication tools, it, it references use of private devices, but it's referencing specifically any communication that's gone through the municipal server. Is that correct? So um, if this information was to be reviewed, it wouldn't mean, I mean, the town has the right to confiscate its own property that's provided. But in this case, it would be more, more so uh, communication that's gone through the server and um, there's nothing in here indicating um, that the confiscation of a person's personal device to review that. I'm just kind of reading through that. So I just want to make sure that that um, is how, I, how I've read this to interpret is the fact that when you're talking about confiscate, um, confiscation of devices, it's town-owned property and that uh, communication-wise through email or text or whatever is through um, the town server as opposed to, um, you know, that, that's where my concern was is the fact of um, access to my own private property, my own personal property. Um, so I just want to clarify, clarification around that. Council Tower, you have a... Yeah, my interpretation of it was that uh, if we are sending communication to any 
any member of the town workforce, council, whatever, is going through our server, so we as a council or whatever has to happen goes through all the emails that are going through. We don't have a right to say you can't look at it. That's my interpretation of what that is. It's not saying you're going to come see me and say, can I have your tablet? It's checking our server and say, that email came through us. We have right to it, and which is the way I look at it. Okay. Um, is that correct? I'm going to ask, is that a correct interpretation? I'm not uh, I, I would interpret it that way as well. Oh, I would interpret it that way as well. And um, I use my phone for a lot of emailing, but I use multiple tablets and laptops, and but it, everything that I email goes through the town server. Um, now, you know, if, if an, our TIPA request came in or something and wanted to look at emails and they said, well, you know, you do emailing on your phone, I'm sure that, that our TIPA request would be looking for the information that they want to see, not... I think I had commented to you once before jokingly, not, you know, 150 photos of my dog. Um, it, but, but the thing is, if it's... Again, if it's going through the, um, the server, it's that, that information is accessible whether somebody has my tablet or somebody else's phone or whatever. Right. Correct. Okay. Okay. Councilor Evans, you have a question? Or? Yeah. I, I, we've had this discussion before, but the under our TIPA, the public has a right to get access to documents that in the custody and control of the public body, which is the town. Their servers are in the custody and control of them, so they have access to that. They don't have any right to get your personal device that I'm aware of. Sure, and uh, it, this is all subject to our TIPA. The, the right to information is balanced by the protection of privacy. So you don't have to give up your privacy um, that we can't do anything that counters our TIPA. We are protected and constrained by our TIPA. Um, that's how I would interpret that, and that's why I'm happy to support it that way, because that's what I think it means. Okay. And that's what I was looking forward to. Just more so the clarification around that. So I, I want to make sure my interpretation, and also when I was talking with Council Tower, that our, the interpretation was, was on par, I guess, to what the intent of the bylaw in that part will say. So. Um, my, my other one was under use of social media, and I know we've had this conversation before and the fact that there's already a, a policy in place for the use of social media. Um, and, I, and I know that this being, I think there was a comment about um, if this is adopted, then that would have to be revisited. Um, I'm just kind of wondering if there's some way to reword this in a manner that it wouldn't have to be revisited and uh, that this uh, code of conduct would reference that policy in regards to how a municipal councillor would conduct uh, themselves um, with the use of social media or how the code of conduct would apply to that. Um, so I think I, I just while he's looking for a response, I think that, that that's always a more difficult question if we have a bylaw and something changes, we have to go through a three phase change of that bylaw while a policy can quickly respond to something that changes. Um, so that would be one question I would, I would have. Uh, the other, Councillor Evans? Yeah, the other part is um, the, and one of the reasons why this is in a bylaw is that the policy is a policy. Bylaws trump policies in terms of authority, but also there's no sanction in the policy. It's just a best practice. It's recommending what you do. This says you must do this, and if you don't, there's a possibility of sanction. So it needs to be here. Whether it's still in our policy or not is, doesn't matter to me, but I'm, I'm not... If you're talking about taking it out of here because it's in a policy, I don't support that. No, what I'm saying is wording it in a manner that referenced the policy. Right? You, you, you indicated that the policy will change. Policy. I mean, in regards to... Um, how this is enforced, I mean, that's covered. So anything that appears in it, um, council or a person who's committed or considered to be convicted of an offense would go through a process. Um, so I, what I'm saying is that um, where it's already been dealt with in policy and it's recorded as to what the responsibilities are, as opposed to having something different um, within the code of conduct, would it not be uh, rewording it in, the, in a manner to reference that policy. That's that's all I'm, I'm indicating. Let's see, Becky. Is 
Councilor Black, please. Um, so uh, again, the, the bylaw, as Councilor Evans said, the bylaw trumps the policy, but I had spoken with the uh, assistant clerk about this and the policy and the bylaw can exist at the same time. Um, the, the policy was written for employees as well. So, and if by some chance we had to get rid of the policy for whatever reason, or it had to be changed, then this bylaw would have to be addressed again. Something would have to be done with social media concerning uh, elected officials specifically. So both of them can exist, but the bylaw that would govern us would be this one. The policy may have to be changed with uh, concerning well, elected officials, if, maybe. If it wasn't there, it would have to. But if it's there, it doesn't have to. So are you indicating that this would supersede po policy then in regards yeah. to the bylaws? Bylaws. Bylaw. Okay. Yeah. okay. Just like acts from bylaws. And the other one is the, under the formal complaint process. So J, it says a member who is subject of a complaint is entitled to, rep, to be represented by legal counsel at the member's sole expense. Um, and I had raised some concern over the fact of, um, of if that was unfounded or the complaint was unfounded, that that uh, person would be left with possibly legal bill. So I'm just wondering about adding um, into this, if the complaint is unfounded or found to be malicious, the legal expenses of the member shall be paid by the town. Did you want to speak to it? I was wondering if this whole thing could be including the staff as well. As a matter of fact, I think they're subject to uh, privacy and all the other things that are in this whole thing so I'm just thinking that maybe we should turn around and include them as well because I believe there should be a code of conduct for them as well so there is a bylaw there's a code of conduct so I didn't know it was a code of conduct so I thought it was just a policy right So the question at, on the floor here is about um, uh, if the legal expense is held by the individual who is, is uh, accused of breaking the bylaw and they find them not guilty, should they be reimbursed their legal expenses? I don't know if we, if that's, I don't know enough where we don't have our legal person here, but. Uh, I would presume that that would be part of the, the case that one would award. Well, can I? Um, we would assume, in most cases, I would think that this would be done by, by his or her peers. It's not going to involve lawyers. That this would be in a case where someone, if someone decides to get Jimmy Cochran to come in to defend them on something about somebody violating a social media policy, it would seem kind of inappropriate, but that means if they were to get off that we would, I don't know. I mean, this, I can't imagine, first of all, that people would be getting lawyers to do this, but if we did, uh, should the town be on the hook for it? Uh, so your point is that the process, this is, this is uh, the last step of the process if someone yeah. is taken to court. Although I suppose someone can always try to get a judicial review. Uh, but whether the judge would hear it or not, I, I, I don't know. That's, this is an extreme case, one I'm not... So Council would have to decide prior to that this. the person was um, not guilty of the charge or the offense, whichever terminology we use, knowing that if they had engaged legal counsel, that we would end up having to pay for it kind of an incentive to convict. I, you know, I just, I don't know. This is not worth sticking a flag on this hill as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, I don't know. So, any response to that? Well, I, I, I yeah, th this is a tough one because I, I, I think that if you were the subject of an offense that got to the point where you were taken to court, then 
you probably shouldn't have made the offense in the first place so that the, the oh, that's different. Oh, well the the legal counsel that that oh, part, part that part should be covered by you but i guess to your point if you are not found guilty of of whatever um, offense then yeah I, I i don't know i'm not sure what to do about that okay i think that i think okay. that if it if I'm, if it if there was a, a resolution to it within uh, a case, then maybe that, like to, to John's point, that maybe it would be covered within the, within okay, the case. I'm, I'm, perhaps I'm misunderstanding it. I thought that this was that the process had gone through and somebody appealed to the court. No, no, uh, no, no. This, this is this part is, of the process yeah. of, so that you would bring a lawyer in to talk to counsel, yeah. represent on counsel. Well, if you go to court, the judge decides oh. who gets cost. It's nothing to do with us. And you never get what you pay. Like nobody who gets awarded costs ever gets their legal bill paid. Right. Uh, this is if somebody were being uh, one of us was charged with an offense under this code, and was making the case. They would have a right to represent themselves, and they decided to hire a lawyer to help them <coughs> represent themselves to counsel. Which strikes me as an odd thing to do. Like, I, I didn't anticipate somebody responding that way. This would be, Bill, you shouldn't have done that. Because what if we say, yeah, he violated the code, but the sanction is a, a warning? Well, they've done it. So if they have a lawyer, he's still going to have to pay the lawyer. I, I, like, we're not, we're not talking about sentencing people to jail here. We're talking about a reprimand of some kind. The worst that we can do is so, not a lot. So then. Why is this indicated that the person, uh, a member who is subject of a complaint, is entitled to be represented by legal counsel if it's not because they are. something? No, no. But but you've indicated that, and your your position is the fact that it, you know, this is something you know we're limited in regards to what we can do and how we can, you know, pr provide. So, um, why would that even be stated if there's not a concern or that or you don't feel that this is would get to that point, I guess. I think it's being stated. Sorry. I think it's being stated the same way it's stated that you're subject to. Uh, um, uh, what was it? Common law or something? Because you are. I don't think anyone can say to you, "You're not allowed to get a lawyer." If if my employer, if I have a job someplace and my employer disciplines me and I hire a lawyer to fight it. My employer can't say to me, you're not allowed to hire a lawyer. I don't think we could say to anybody, you're not allowed a right to legal representation. I think we just are, and I think the, our lawyer put that in the document, acknowledging that fact. But, but what they're saying is, if you do that, you've got to pay for it. We're not going to pay for it. But Deputy Mayor, actually. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. I think we're conflating two things here. One is, are you entitled to representation? And two is, who pays for it? Um, <clears throat> when I was at Mount Allison, there were several instances where people got lawyers for various things. And uh, that was their choice. And no matter how it went, the university wasn't on the hook to pay their legal bills. Uh, so, I, um, I mean, if you want to, for whatever we do here, I think I agree with Council Arvins, it was probably fairly minor. I think engaging counsel is probably getting a little overboard. Um, if it got to that point where it was had to have counsel and it was uh, that serious, I would suspect it would be in court anyway. Okay. Good. That's it. Okay. Thank you. So we did uh, discuss the items uh, under the question. Under the question, I have something I'd like to say. Council Michel is done. Okay, okay. Councillor Evans, please. Um, I want to speak in favor of this motion. And first of all, I want to thank all the people who did all the work in preparing it. This stuff doesn't just happen. And so I appreciate uh, that. And I'm delighted that it's finally come to fruition. I think that, that it's really important that council hold itself to a higher standard than just not breaking the law. I'm pleased with the code as it is, and I think that it's an improvement over our existing policy. However, there are two areas in which I believe it should be strengthened, and I have previously apprised my colleagues and the Policy Bylaw Committee to this effect. The First Amendment has to do with gifts and reads this. I move that Section 15, Gifts and Benefits, be amended to remove the part of the second sentence which reads, 
that could be reasonably seen to influence any decision made by him or her in carrying out his or her functions as a member. So that the sentence and section would end after members are prohibited from accepting any fees, gifts, gratuities, or other benefits. And I would like to speak to this if I can get a seconder. Okay, amendment moved by uh, Councillor Evans. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Aiken. Okay. So I believe that the language in the code should be stronger and more consistent with the staff's policy, which states the acceptance of gifts, favors, or services, however well-intentioned, is strictly prohibited. I would prefer employing that same language as in the staff policy, but will settle for simply removing the latter part of the sentence, as I specified in my motion. Gifts are sometimes given because they work. They can influence behavior even when the person is unaware of it. I think that we should avoid even the appearance of profiting from our office the same way we do with conflict of interest. We always err on the side of caution. And then a couple of additional points. Uh, this topic refers to gifts that a member, i.e. a member of council, might receive as a member. They're not birthday presents you get from your family. Uh, but something like complimentary tickets to a group that is asking us for funding. Uh, I would add that if this motion passes, it would be prudent to establish a protocol whereby gifts received officially by the mayor or a councillor shall be declared, and then there be a protocol for designating their disposition. In the case of a, a mug, you probably get to keep it, but you would always declare it. Um, and so that's, that's my motion, and that's my speak to it. So I hope we get some support. Okay, so any other comments on this motion to amend? Question? Question? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Well, Councillor Finney is a nay, uh, but the motion is carried. And my second, second amendment has to do with my concern about individual councillors telling staff what to do and reads, I move that section 23 of the draft bylaw be amended to replace has executive authority over uh, with shall instruct or give direction to such that the section would then read, under the direction of the chief administrative officer, town staff and employees serve council as a whole. No individual member shall instruct or give direction to town staff, to town staff slash employees. And I'm prepared to speak to this if I get a seconder. Moved by Councillor Evans. Seconded by Councillor Black. Okay, the draft code of conduct makes three references that I have found which allude to this topic. Section 21 says decision-making authority lies with council, not with individual member. A member must not purport to bind the council, either by publicly expressing their personal views on behalf of council when not authorized to do so, or by giving direction to town administration agents, contractors, consultants, or other service providers of the town or prospective vendors. 23, which we just read, which says we have no executive authority, and I'm not sure exactly what that means, and then 25, it says a member must not, A, involve themselves in matter of administration which fall within the jurisdiction of the CAO, or B, use or attempt to use their authority or influence for the purpose of intimidating, threatening, coercing, commanding, or influencing any town administration with the intent of interfering with their duties. My concern is that none of this is as straightforward and unambiguous as it is in the CAO bylaw, and the CAO bylaw is not where prohibitions on council behavior should be, in my opinion. In the CAO bylaw, it says only council as a whole can direct the CAO, and no individual member of council committee or member of a committee established by council shall instruct or give direction to, either publicly or privately, written or oral, the chief administrative officer or any employee of the town. So that's why. Other comments on the question? Motion to amend. Councillor Finney. Uh, I'm going to speak against this one again. As a matter of fact, because the simple fact is, is that we have been around here long enough to know, and even some of the new people, know that actually what we can and cannot do. We have them covered under the Right to Information, Elections Act, and Brunswick Human Rights, all of those that we already, already have to abide by. The code of conduct that we're putting in place, to me, and this is my personal opinion, is to kind of keep everybody quiet, as a matter of fact. We already know exactly, we can't tell the staff what to do. We can't tell the CAO what to do, but we can bring to their attention their concerns. That's how I feel. 
And the thing is, is to do it, have to always do it as a whole of council? You mean to say we can't talk to them individually? I think that's unacceptable, as a matter of fact. And I'm saddened that, that it's gotten to this now. It seems like this is to turn around and make sure that nobody talks to anybody. And I'm very saddened about it. And as far as the code of conduct, when mentioned about the fact I said it should include staff as well, I was told that there is a policy code of ethics or something? That's ethics, that's got to do it. I don't know if it's the same thing. I'd like to read that, I'll have to read it and go over it. But what's gonna to pertain to us has to pertain to them as well. And that's why I'll be voting against it. Uh, Councilor Tower first. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm gonna vote in favor of this. I, I don't believe the intent of that is that we don't talk to staff uh, we have liaison meetings and we exchange information. I've gone in and I've spoken, sat down with the CAO and I've discussed different things. I give my opinion towards it, but I always acknowledge that he's the boss and not me, but I just, so I share my concerns and I've done it, no matter whether it be for Dwayne or Jamie or, you know, so I don't think the intent of that is for me to shut my mouth and not say anything. But I have never gone about the idea of thinking, you got to do that because I said this is the way it is. So I I can't share that thought pattern, but I do like the intent of it. Uh, just Councilor Butcher, please. Oh, I see it. Behind your bottle top. <laughs> um, I I just like to reiterate what Councilor Tower said. This is suggesting that we would say that no individual member of council shall instruct or give direction to. It doesn't say that we can't talk to people or we can't provide an opinion or that we can't discuss things with them. It says that we can't instruct or give direction. So I could say, gosh, you know, I really like that or I really don't like that, but I can't instruct and I can't give direction. So I think that that's the clarifying words in there. So I like that that's in there. It gives us clear guidelines about how we can communicate with staff, not that we can or can't, but how we can. <coughs> Councillor Evans? Yeah. Well, it's my motion, I'm allowed to speak twice. Read the rules. <laughs> um, the, the, the point about uh, somebody's personal opinion not liking having a code of conduct, the province of New Brunswick has instructed us that we must come up with a bylaw, a code of conduct in the form of a bylaw. That's why we're doing it. So we're talking about the content of it. And we've had many discussions where it's been made clear what Councillor Tower and Councillor Butcher just said. Of course we can talk to staff. In fact, our lawyer told us that. In fact, that's a good thing to do. We just can't tell them what to do. So we're clarifying that. We all know that that's what it means. So thank you. Okay, so there is a, a motion amendment on the on the table um, in terms of directing staff. So a question? question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Councillor Finney, please record as a nay. And that motion is carried. Is that it for Council Evans? No. So we're back to So we're back to the original motion. There's no more questions or the amended, motion. the amended motion as per the two amended items. So I call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Councilor Finney is a negative on that. Otherwise, the motion is carried. Okay, Councilor Black. I move that council give third and final reading to bylaw number 271, a bylaw relating to establishing a code of conduct for members of council. Moved by Councillor Black. Seconded by Councillor Tower. Question? Question. Question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Councillor Finney has a nay, the motion is carried. Councillor Black again. I move that Council give second reading section by section to bylaw number 272, a bylaw respecting the procedure and organization of Council. Public notice is hereby given that the Town 
Council of the Town of Sackville proposes to enact the following bylaws. Bylaw number 272, a bylaw respecting the procedure and organization of council. Definitions. Section 1, first meeting newly elected council. Section 2, deputy mayor. Section 3, regular council meetings. Section 4, deadline. Section 5, special meeting of council. Section 6, minutes of meeting. Section 7, agenda of meetings. Section 8, information dissemination. Section 9, motions. Section 10, precedence. Section 11, decorum. Section 12, voting. Section 13, conflict of interest. Section 14, interruptions. Section 15, bylaws. Section 16, petitions and delegations. Section 17, reconsideration. Section 18, parliamentary rules. Section 19, closed in-camera discussion of council. Section 20, liaison councillors. Section 21, other committees, boards, and reporting positions. Section 22, general duties of a committee. Section 23, electronic meetings. Section 24, rules and regulations. Section 25, repeal. Moved by Councillor Black. Seconded by Councillor Evans. Councillor Michaud, I think you were first. Thank you, Worship. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to how I, how it was suggested I approach this in regards to discussing this underneath the, uh, the motion. Um, some suggested amendments. Um, first being around um, question periods. Um, special meetings of council. Um, I, I would like to um, suggest that, um, you know, uh, within that, it states already, uh, all special council meetings are open to the public except for closed in-camera discussions for the purpose pursuant to 68.1 Local Governance Act. The closed in-camera discussion shall occur in the same manner as per, I believe it's section four, regular meetings of council. I would like to add into that a 15 minute press slash public question period will be held at the end of the special council meeting for clarification purposes of information shared with council. Thank you. Councilor Finney. I agree with that. 15-minute period, we'll be fine. So it's open for your discussion. Is that it's the same as last time he's asking for, he's asking for topics to, to have uh, okay you do that I will second yep okay. if John picks you <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll come back and go through what you want to m move as a motion afterward? Or okay, so we're, we're going to do it all at all at one time? Yeah, go what, what, what if something's not? <laughs> well, we'll come back and just go through okay. which one. Okay, perfect. The Great. Um, under agenda of meetings, um, again, it has to do with um, question periods. And uh, I, I know that although we're, we don't follow it to the T at the first of our meetings, it does state otherwise that... Uh, there may be a 15 minute question period at the beginning of the regular council meeting for the purpose of clarifying matters of minor nature, matters regarding to the agenda. I know that we've been very accommodating in you know, allowing other type of questions to occur. And I'm just kind of wondering if we should reword that, um, such as a 15 minute question period will be held at the beginning and conclusion of a regular meeting of council uh, starting with the media first to allow the media or public to ask questions or for clarification of business impacting the municipality. So say the last part again, as, as clarification of? Uh, clarification of business impacting the municipality. Clear? That's pretty broad, right? Any comments? Any comments? Yep. Yeah, just one. Council Black, please. So you're suggesting to have the press ask questions at the beginning and the end of the regular council meeting, as well as the public? No, we can cover the last. 
because a 15 minute question period will be held at the beginning and conclusion of regular council meetings starting with the media first so press at the beginning and the end of the council meeting as opposed to the way it is currently where it's public only in the beginning and press at the end Yeah, but what says it? Okay. Councilor Tower. Thank you, Worship. I'm just trying to figure out. I, if Bruce wanted to get up at the very first, there's nothing there that should inhibit him from coming up and asking a question. So to say that press can't, I think it's the wrong interpretation. And I'd like to go along with the meeting and the spirit of the motion. If you're making a statement like that, that's not the kind of meeting or intent I like out of that. Sorry. I feel you know, it should, still, should be open to him if he wants to come up and ask a question. I've never heard the mayor say, you know, you can't come up. And he's asking, as anybody? So therefore, I presume the intent of that is that if he wanted to ask a question, he could. Um, I don't I don't have any problem I mean this is just me personally but I'm, I don't have any problem with the press asking questions at the beginning but what you're proposing is is really open I mean I, I guess the way we have it right now clarifying matters of a minor nature or matters regarding the agenda so the question period leading into our regular council meeting is questions of a minor nature and I know that that's sort of again fluffy but this would be up to the chair to uh, say whether that question is appropriate to ask at that time um, maybe it's a question about the agenda that's upcoming that the chair might then say we will cover that um, and you can ask your question at the end or whatever um, so yeah anyway I, I, I think the suggestion is just a, a little broad um, and that's just my my thoughts I I mean we've been pretty good with our question period um, the, the, <laughs> the mayor has been very welcoming with most questions pretty much every question that gets asked gets answered and there hasn't really been much of a silence um, that I've seen um, but anyway I, I mean I, I don't I, I don't mind it the way that it is currently and if we want to add in that the press could ask questions at mm -hmm. that time too I'm, I'm okay with that. The press, sorry, press in public, so anyone? Yeah. I understand. Your, your position, thank you. Oh, that's good. Um, Can I just weigh in on that too? Councillor Evans? I, um, uh, I've now spent more time up here than I have up the, sitting down there, but that happened not that long ago. I really like the fact that we can be asked questions. I think that's important. Even though it's inconvenient, and even though most councils don't have question period, they certainly don't have two. I don't mind being the best at being open and accessible to people. I do, I would encourage the chair to say to people who are giving speeches that if you want to make a presentation to council, talk to the clerk and get on the agenda for a discussion meeting. Because if you want to present to council, you have that right and do it. But question period should be about the business of council. Um, now, I'm not the mayor and I don't want to be the mayor, but the chair has a great deal of latitude in entertaining questions, whether it's something on the agenda or something, it's about something that's not even in our turf, but, but the hospital, or whatever. We, we are open and we answer questions, but I think the honest answer needs to be, uh, I don't know the answer to that question and we'll get back to you. Um, so that I would encourage anyone who wants to ask questions to send the question in advance if you want an answer, you know, on TV, um, or you have to wait a month, or you know, something like that. But it's uh, the more question periods, the better, as long as they're managed properly. I have no problem with that, and I, I welcome it. I like the idea of a, a bear pit. Sounds great. Thank you. Good. So I think you've got. Two there. You got another one? Um, I, I just um, uh, there's a, there's a couple more I had. Um, okay. uh, it, it's not necessary an amendment, but it has to do with the liaison counselors and the terms of reference, uh, the mandate that's within that terms of reference, and um, we we talk how it's maybe broad. And I'm just wondering 
Um, I know we had talked about possibly making an appendix, uh, appendix to the bylaw. However, it could change or fluctuate, which makes sense that you wouldn't have to change the whole bylaw every time, so you could change your terms of reference. But I think we should revisit the, uh, or I'd like to suggest we revisit the terms of reference because I think there's some components in there that um, we should discuss in regards to, um, you know, the actual liaison group's agenda, that, you know, the, the notes from, from that and the sharing of that type of thing, the opportunity for other councillors to participate or provide suggestions for topics on the uh, agenda um, and that information being shared back to council other than in the format of uh, the monthly report. So I just kind of thought maybe that's something we could talk about. I have no problem with, with the way it is that is, as is, uh, and being included in the bylaw. It's just more so maybe some, some other opportunity to enhance that mandate so that we have a better understanding of, of our roles and our responsibilities to the liaison role. So. I think there's two points. One is that the consistency of terms of reference for the liaison with, with clarity. But uh, I'm not sure about the second part where others can, who are not liaisons, can meet, go to any meeting. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I, I think it's kind of an unwritten rule right now that if a counselor wants to attend another liaison meeting that they have the ability to attend, do they not? They, they're, they're, they're allowed to attend, right? But, I mean, it's not something that's kind of out there. Um, it hasn't been encouraged. The, the mayor is, uh, can go to anyone they, they wish to go to. Right. Um, the understanding is that people are basically assigned to liaisons, and that's why we ask which ones you're most interested in so that they can really right. drill into that. So uh, people can get more information, uh, but they will not have that background when they step into a meeting and say, well, I now need you guys to do this. Um, that would be my only concern. I mean, certainly people can come to un better understand something, but I'd be a little bit concerned over, you know. Well, no, but th I think that's what I'm, I'm getting to here is that what's the role and responsibilities of the actual liaison, but also the inclusion of council if they want to actually participate in, in, in that, that meeting, not necessarily provide any sort of comment or direction or feedback because we're not supposed to be providing direction, right, as individual counselors. Um, so it's just more so um, identifying the fact that that can happen, um, identifying the fact that, you know, when these meetings are happening, um, also the fact that a counselor may be out and hear something in pertaining to public works and would like to ensure that it gets on the agenda you know, the process they would follow in order to make sure that it's discussed at the next liaison um, uh, meeting, um, those type of things. Um, I think this is kind of a, could be a work in progress, and I'm, I'm not going to tie, it's, it, it's not a, for me, it's not a determining factor on, on this bylaw. It's just the fact that I think we have the opportunity here to enhance these terms of reference a little bit, add a little more meat to it, uh, to help with that role. Right. I think that, uh, well, first I'll come back on, on this. So, Councillor Butcher, please. Thank you. Um, to Councillor Michaud's point, one of the things that I've often thought I would like to have, I mean, we go to our liaison meetings, we hear an update on what's going on, and then when we have our special meeting, we have a little more, more of a heads up on what is presented by the managers. Um, but one of the things that I have sort of toyed with, and again, open for conversation, or I've often thought, you know, what if after the liaison counselors have our meeting, what if we just quickly sent a little email that went to council, all of council, you know, met for the policy bylaw thing today, we discussed these bylaws, um, had a great conversation about this, you know, just a short point form, here's what we did. So you've also got an idea of what's coming up, perhaps not in the same detail as those of us who sat hashing it over for an hour, but a bit of a heads up about it. So I've, I've wondered about that kind of a process at times. Councilor Black, please. We're getting a little bit off topic just because the, t the terms of reference are not in this bylaw, just referencing it. Um, but the town clerk had told me that we hadn't looked at it at the terms of reference in two to three years. 
so certainly I think it might be a good idea to look at it and see if there's something we can change or uh, as a council if there's something that we want to look at just as we did with procedures of uh, council in our code of conduct to see if maybe there's better communication tools or whatever what other ideas we have but that's why I was raising it. I know that you know it's a working document no that's great I'm, I'm glad that you know we can look at it further um, the other two things just more so um, on the other committees and boards um, and I just need clarification on this one of the ones that's noted is Southeast Regional Service Commission um, that the mayor has the authority to appoint to um, it was my understanding that the Southeast Regional Service Commission is actually no one other than the mayor or deputy mayor can sit there so I'm just kind of wondering how that would kind of fall on I mean we're getting monthly reports but it, I think it does indicate about the mayor um, will appoint somebody to the or a member of council to these so I'm just kind of wondering um, how we ensure that you know, how we write that if it if it should be there um, the other thing on that is the fact that we've lost track of our our health care situation over the last few years and think maybe that maybe I'm not sure what you know there is a, a steering committee now but maybe that steering committee should be noted here as a as a uh, committee that you know if if it's decided that the steering committee isn't chaired by the mayor or um, the chief of uh, Fort Folly that uh, somebody else takes that role that to ensure council representation on that health care committee uh, maybe that should be at it and also the fact that it does indicate here that these committees are to report monthly back to council now, I know monthly meetings don't always happen but if somehow we can incorporate that into our reportings similar to what the library does there's, there's a segment there um, for the library if they don't have a meeting it's noted library had no meeting you know it could be the same thing for um, Saffle Arts wall or the sports wall uh, the waterfowl park advisory just to ensure that it's kind of front and center that we understand that they have a, an accountability back to council to report even if there is nothing to report um, and I'm not quite sure if it was stricken I, I'm just kind of looking at the uh, the heritage board I think was one of those and I'm not quite sure if that was uh, stricken from there or not because uh, that no longer exists so it's gone. is it gone okay and and my only other concern is the electronic means um, the electronic means um, by participating by electronic means uh, I, I can't support this bylaw with that segment in here we, we haven't done our, our due diligence on policy around that doesn't mean that we won't add it eventually but I think at this point in time it's an unknown I know we've gotten some information on on that but um, I, I'd like to see that kind of removed for now and, and revisit it down the road once we kind of get a better handle on how that's going to work and what policy would, would drive it. So. I was going to say in uh, relation to other councillors uh, being invited to the liaison meetings, ever since I've come here in 2004, and we've always said, you know, if we've asked the people who are the liaison councillors, do you mind if I sit on it? There was never a problem. There seems to be kind of resistance to restriction. Um, uh, in relation to Councillor Butcher's idea, that's fine. But the thing is, is wouldn't it be better if you felt like you wanted to be there personally, so you could hear firsthand exactly what's going on? There's never been a problem with that. <coughs> Same thing as some of the boards, other committees that I'm on up at the university. There's always been a seat that one can ask to sit in on, and and so I don't see any reason why we seem to be restricted. Well, there's only two appointed to it, so that's the only two that should go. What's the problem with having anybody go into it if they want to sit in on it? I don't see any problem with that. And as far as electronic means, I have a problem with it too. We voted on it. We said no. And the reason we said no was because of the fact too expensive. And secondly, um, we turned around and said that if you're elected, then you should be here, not by connecting by electronic means. And so I'll stand by that one. Councillor Evans first, and then I'll come back to you. Do you want to go first? No, you go first. Okay. Um, the 
to the business of the uh, participation electronically. The Local Governance Act says it is permitted to use electronic means to communi of communication in council meeting if it allows members of council to hear and speak to each other. And in the case of a meeting that is open to the public, allows the public to hear the members. We can meet this standard with a speaker phone, something we already have and at no extra expense. Having heard the comments of some of my colleagues, I feel I must point out that the intention of this provision is not to allow a member to choose to participate electronically instead of in person, but rather to permit a member who otherwise could not participate to do so electronically. Currently, a member can choose to miss a meeting without providing a reason or incurring a sanction. I think this is something that the Code of Conduct should prescribe, but having already made two amendments, I'll save that for another day. But this section of the procedures bylaw provides for the opposite case, where a member chooses to attend but cannot. I think that it's bad enough that we don't sanction the former without preventing the latter. I suggest that we leave the draft as it is in this case for these reasons. And the fact that it's there doesn't mean that anyone has to use it. It's there in case, let's just say, for example, that there was a pandemic, you know, hypothetically speaking, and somebody was quarantined, right? They would be able to participate with their phone. We've all participated in conference calls where somebody can hear what's going on and can speak and can vote. Our duty, as Councillor Finney says, is to be present. What if we want to be but cannot for a reason like that? Why would we go out of our way to not provide means for someone to do that if they wanted to. I just don't get it. Yep. Council Black. I, I just wanted to make a, a, a correction. Um, we, uh, Councillor, fin Councillor Finney had said that we voted to keep the um, uh, electronic meeting in. We didn't vote for that. We met in a working session where we did argue this point back and forth and you said it, you know, it doesn't work, it, there's too much involved. And <clears throat> at the end of it, uh, there was a suggestion that we, could, that we put it in in, uh, in case of um, pertaining to what the uh, LGA says. Uh, and nobody said no. There were sort of nods and half nods, but nobody said no. So staff went ahead with putting this in. So there was no, anyway, there was no, just for the record, there was no vote. We didn't vote for this. Okay. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Um, let's go over a couple of Councillor Michaud's omnibus comments there. Um, the Regional Service Commission, it's all mayors and deputy mayors. The only people that can, um, I go to every, pretty well every session. I can't vote. I have to sit in the public gallery. Um, and, and they're open public meetings, so anybody can go. If you want to go and see what's going on, you're welcome to. Um, <clears throat> on the notion of electronic meetings, um, there is going to be the one that was presented to us uh, informally was going to cost over $6,000 just to get the equipment for it, which would be a video um, representation. Um, and I guess my sort of hard line comment is, you know, you're elected to do a job. Part of the job is being here for meetings. Um, and if you can't be, well, you can't be. I mean, it's not like we're voting on a world peace every time or anything. Um, so if you have to miss a meeting, fine, you miss a meeting. If you're way sick, I can't see the <laughs> desirability, I guess, of having your ill face at that height on that screen. Um, just the, the notion of a, a call in with a uh, a, a phone, uh, maybe. Um, and we've all seen in a uh, closed meeting we had the <laughs> reliability of some of these uh, conferencing tools. They just very often don't work. Um, so for those reasons, I, I think we, I agree with taking the electronic part out until we can you know, sort of nail down exactly what we mean by it. Um, and there was one, oh yeah, now part of it pilloried for this one. Um, but the notion of, of, of question periods. Um, I think we have to, I have no problem with question periods, but we have to keep in mind that these meetings are, as I think I said the other day, aren't town halls. They are, we are in effect, the board of directors of a corporation. 
and these meetings are for us to do the business of the corporation. Now, involving, and this is where we get in odd definitions of what the town is. Um, the town that we're dealing with in these meetings is the incorporated legal entity of the town. Um, I think a lot of people that are out there see the town as, you know, the, the, the people and the dogs and cats and streets and trees and all that stuff. Um, so I think we have to draw a clear distinction. Now, I'm not against the question periods, but I would like to include the, you know, fine, have them. But I think that has to be very prescribed and, like Councillor Evans was saying, not get off into diatribes and presentations and uh, stick to the business of the meeting. Okay. So with those restrictions, um, I think we are, I mean, we are, as we've said, way over the top when it comes to openness for this sort of thing. Um, most councils, we have a list of eight councils similar to us. Uh, we're the only one with any question periods, let alone two. Uh, and I don't know of any other municipality in New Brunswick that has two. I can't think of one. And very many of them aren't open periods. They are, um, you have to submit questions and someone in the administration decides if your question is going to make it to the floor or not. So um, I like them, but I think there is a danger in going a bit far with them and interfering with the business of what we're supposed to be conducting here. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Tower. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, since he's talking question period, I'll nail that one first. Uh, I, I like expanding it. I, I like giving people a chance to ask questions. It adds to our transparency, and I think it's fantastic. It's just like on Monday night, once uh, uh, the first Monday night, that we should be able to give the people a copy of our package that we receive on Monday night of the discussion night. I think we should be giving that to them, allow them that might even add to the questions. Who knows? But I, I like the idea of question periods and uh, to give the people a chance to to get things off their chest that might be of value to the municipality. Electronics, I agree with the deputy mayor. and I, I don't think we should be wasting any money. Uh, if you can't make it, okay, you can't make it. I think if you look and check and see how many council sessions are actually missed, and uh, it's not earth-shattering motions we're making sometimes. So therefore, it's like, if you're not here, you're not here. Too bad. Uh, I was surprised it came in. I was surprised it lived through our, our discussions before it even got to the uh, motions. Uh, I only heard one voice that night say, well, we should put it there just in case, after everybody else was saying they didn't want it. But that's all right. I, I'm, I'm not in favor of it, and I really can't see myself voting in favor of the whole package it's like an omnibus bill you're throwing out there, and well, I'm going to toss this in here, like it or lump it. And uh, so, and the, the other part about appointments, uh, Deputy Mayor, was that he was just saying that the, it says in there the mayor can appoint to that, and the mayor can't. It's either the mayor or the deputy mayor, and nobody else. So, it, and that's the part that was being talked about. So, anyway, that's my three cents worth. Okay, Councillor Evans. Yeah, just the as that lone voice, I just want to reiterate that if you want to throw out uh, or not or exclude video conferencing, I have no problem with that. What I'm saying is, and so that if the argument of cost is stops being relevant, and there's nothing compulsory about it. So um, I I'm surprised, dare I say, disappointed that people say they don't want to let someone take advantage of something that is easy and cheap. Uh, in order to participate, we've had several people talk about the importance of attending meetings, and we have a number of people who, who for whatever reason, don't bother showing up. But if somebody wants to, we're going to actually put a barrier in their way. Uh, I've had my last kick at the can for this vote. I'll leave it at that. Okay, so, Councillor Michaud, here's what I have, uh, I think. One, uh, it appears that we can remove uh, electronic meetings. So uh, there's a partial motion. We've, uh, the clerk is going to look at the liaison terms of reference and that's a separate task. So I have a uh, CERC, we've identified that it is the members as, as per the board of directors from the CERC. 
Health is a, is a question for council to consider. I would suggest we don't do that at the moment because we do have a structure, it'll get confusing. Heritage was answered. So I see that there are, uh, if you wish to make a motion, I see th three items. Question period at uh, special meetings of council at the end. Um, uh, the uh, agenda for the meetings. What, what's that second one you brought there? Oh, agenda meetings, um, the uh, question period around that. Um, but, um, oh, it was the wording of that. The that. wording of that. Okay. And that's, and that's fine. I think after the discussion that was, was had, um, I'm, I'm fine with the input that came back. So okay. uh, my amendment would just involve the, the first one around special meetings of council. And the removal of electronic. Uh, and the removal of electronic and just again just that clarity around the boards of commission uh, boards of commissions um, if, if that's something that needs to be amended now I'll throw that in if not if it's something that we're going to as you said look at down the road um, I, I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of it that's all right. so. so the question for the circ is that makes reference to someone being appointed by the mayor or a deputy mayor so Okay, so that okay. so that should be included. So the motion then okay. on the floor. Do you so, want to try to put that together, or do you want? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll, I'll, okay. I'll give it a shot here. So, uh, so I move um, the these following amendments to uh, bylaw 272 under section six special meetings of council. Uh, I would read all special council meetings are open to the public except for a closed slash in-camera discussion for the purpose pursuant to 68.1 of the Local Governance Act. A closed slash in-camera discussion shall occur in the same manner as per, I believe it's section four, um, regular meetings of council. A 15 minute press slash public question period will be held at the end of a special council meeting for clarification purposes of information shared with council uh, that um, under the um, section, and I'm trying to think what section it is here, uh, 22 under committees, boards, and reporting positions, the uh, Southeast Regional Service Commission um, be stricken from the list. And also, Section 23, attendance at meetings by electric means be stricken from the, from the bylaw. Okay, motion is moved by Councillor Michaud. Are you comfortable with the wording? We'll get that off the tape if we really need it. Okay, moved by Councillor Michaud. I'll second that, Your Worship. Seconded by Councillor Tal. I move to separate the motions. Yeah. You don't want all three in one? Sure. No, that's fine. That, that's okay. fine. So we'll <laughs> separate okay. them. Sure. We'll go with number so one. So we'll go with number one. So that's the section six, special meetings of council. Um, the addition of a 15 minute press slash public question period will be held at the end of the special council meeting for clarification purposes of information shared with council. Moved by Councillor Michaud. Seconded by Councillor Tower. Question? Question? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Number two. Thank you, Your Worship. So under Section 22, other committees, boards, and reporting positions, that Southeast Regional Service Commission be uh, stricken from the list of boards. Moved by Councillor Michaud, seconded by Councillor Tower. Question? Question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. And my last motion would be to strike 23, attendance at meetings by electronic means. Please. Second, second by Councillor Tower. Question? Question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nays are recorded by Councillor Black and Councillor Evans. Is that, did I catch them both? Okay. Yes. So the motion is carried with two negatives. Okay, thank you. So we're now back to the original motion. <laughs> amended. As amended. <laughs> As amended, um, so that is on the floor. Question? Questions. Hold on, Councillor Fenney, please. Uh, one other thing that I noticed in here that I made note of, uh, the minutes of the meeting. 
Uh, it says that the clerk, assistant clerk, shall record in a book all resolutions, decisions, and proceedings of council without note or comment. May I ask why you wouldn't have note or comment? Clerk, please. Thank you. The Municipalities Act was pretty defined. Well, the Local Governance Act states without note or comment when recording minutes. Well, I think we should go against that. Turn around and have note and comment <laughs> so people will There's know exactly to. what's going on. <laughs> so who said what? He said, she said. So we're, we're doing it in accordance with the provision of the Local Governance Act. Yeah. Okay. So original motion has been moved and seconded. As amended, question. question, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. You have more? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At least, nobody's going to give you a 10 o'clock extension. I move that council give third and final reading to bylaw number 272, a bylaw respecting the procedure and organization of council. Moved by Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Michaud. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Councillor Black again. I move that Council give first reading in name only to bylaw number 262A, a bylaw to amend bylaw number 262, a bylaw to regulate street traffic. Moved by Councillor Black, seconded by Deputy Mayor Aiken. Question? Can I? Can I? Oh. Sorry, can I? Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, Go is ahead. everybody, for those of us, sorry. Yeah. Are you were, Councillor Black, you were going to make a. Uh, I, I guess it's already been said, but the push for this was, uh, the push for this was, bec was due to the um, business community. Um, they wanted to have, um, they wanted to have parking available on Saturday. Sunday already is, but. Uh, just so that there's more parking available for customers downtown, which um, I'm in full agreement with. Uh, but I do want to say, again, I said this at the special council meeting, but um, I, th I think it should be said of, of local business owners to be vigilant, to tell their employees to make sure that they park uh, further away and give parking spaces to people who uh, shop their locations, as well as people from out of town who may come to shop their location. So uh, I just wanted to make that public notice. Okay, so motion is on to uh, first reading. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? That motion is carried. I move that council give second reading section by section to bylaw number 262A, a bylaw to amend bylaw number 262, a bylaw to regulate street traffic. Bylaw number 262A, a bylaw to amend bylaw 262, a bylaw to regulate street traffic. The mayor and council of the town of Sackville enacts as follows. One, bylaw num number 262, a bylaw to relate street traffic as follows. Section 8.2 will now read as follows. 8.1, except where otherwise provided in this bylaw, no person shall stop, stand, or park a vehicle, whether attended or otherwise, for a period of time longer than that designated in Schedules G and H. These restrictions apply every day, except Saturday, Sunday, and federal and provincial statutory holidays, on any of the designated highways or parts of highways, or on any public parking lot owned or maintained by the Town of Sackville between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. This bylaw comes into force on the date of final passing thereof. Moved by Councillor Black. Seconded by Councillor Michaud. Question? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion is carried. <coughs> and that, are you finally done there, Councillor Black? <laughs> we move to personnel. Councillor Evans, you're speaking to that, I believe. Am I doing personnel? No, you're doing personnel. Oh, Andrew. Councillor Black. Andrews. <laughs> I was just. Thanks. 
Um, the, thank you. The personnel report can be found on page 44 of the package. Uh, the council, council liaison meeting was held on February 20th, uh, 2020. During the pay periods of February, there were 36 permanent, empl permanent employees and one temporary employee. The hiring process for the public works manager superintendent is in progress. We'll have a motion for that in, uh, tonight. The town has advised the RCMP of the town's interest to move forward on filling the CPO vacancy. And the HR policies continue to be reviewed with liaison counselors of personnel and policy and bylaws. The HNS committee has also reviewed and updated its operating procedures to be more in line with the format and requirements of WorkSafe NB. And that's the report. If there's any questions, but I have a motion after that as well. Questions on the report? Hearing none. I do not have it. You have a motion? I move that council appoint Robert McLean as the Public Works Manager Superintendent, effective March 30th, 2020. Moved by Councillor Black, seconded by Deputy Mayor Aiken. Question? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. All right. Corporate affairs. Councillor Michaud. Thank you, Worship. Um, the report for Corporate Affairs Strategic Development appears on uh, page 45. Um, just like to make a note, uh, the liaison group met actually on February 26th. The report indicates January 29th, but it was the 26th that we met on. Um, I'll just touch on some highlights here. Uh, work continues on the town's new marketing plan. Key stakeholder interviews in a public rural cafe have been completed. Consultants are now using all the input to create the plan. That will guide the town's positioning efforts and future marketing initiatives. Uh, department would like to thank everyone who's participated in the rural cafe and stakeholder interviews. And staff are expecting a draft plan to be presented to council in April. I know that uh, the mayor touched on this in his report. The, um, the mayor's round table on climate change, um, it indicates we'll be meeting soon, but uh, actually met on March the uh, 5th it was, um, reviewing the February 1st, 2020 public forum and submissions that were submitted. Group will also use this time to explore long-term structure and uh, also um, determine best projects, actions, recommendations, and as indicated, we'll be presenting um, uh, the that information to council. The, um, we want to continue to remind Sackville businesses um, and interested owner operators that registration is, is ongoing for the Sackville chapter of the Chamber of Commerce uh, of Greater Moncton. Sackville businesses have now, um, several businesses actually have now s signed up. The town is also a proud member and representatives from the, the Moncton Chamber will be visiting Sackville um, local businesses soon to promote the Chamber and the benefits of being a member. As noted, staff have been working on an economic development incentive program amid, uh, or aimed at uh, helping accelerate the development of underutilized properties and respond to develop interests that was presented to Council last Monday, and there will be a motion this evening uh, to adopt the incentive program. Um, the third annual resident survey is now live, uh, and this initiative is a requirement of the strategic plan and is intended to obtain feedback on various service delivery areas. Um, we are eager to increase the number of participants this year. Uh, sur the survey is featured on our website and has been distributed via our social media channels, Civic Center Sign, monthly newsletter, et cetera, in order to reach a wide variety of residents. Um, it doesn't take long, and we'd really appreciate everyone uh, participating and taking just a few minutes to uh, fill that out. Um, this is already mentioned this evening. I just want to touch on it again about an open house that will uh, happen here on uh, March the 24th in regards to the upcoming uh, municipal election. Uh, Mayor and, and several councillors and staff will be on hand to talk about uh, life and government and uh, hopefully um, those interested will, will attend, hopefully get a good turnout. Um, something that's uh, kind of exciting happening here for our town is that Mount Allison is embarking on a plan to renovate and revitalize the uh, R.P. Bell Library. 
believe it or not, the, this is a 50-year-old facility and one of the most essential buildings on campus. The uh, university is looking for feedback from the community and the university in town will uh, host a community meeting on Tuesday, March 17th uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 here at Town Hall. And something that was uh, a very important conference that staff attended um, uh, February 19th to 20th, uh, the App Adaptation Canada 2020 conference in Vancouver. Um, staff presented in two sessions, overcoming adaptation inertia in small communities, the interplay of local governance, educational and resource limitations, and innovation and experimentation. Uh, one thing that was noted is staff, um, they're very fortunate to attend and it was nice to have other municipalities and practitioners interested in our stormwater retention pond. And that's all I have uh, for the report. I do have a motion, Your Worship. Questions on the report? Councillor Black. Uh, just a, a couple of quick ones. I, I hope quick anyway. <clears throat> um, uh, is there anything you can tell us about the brace meeting? Um, what, what that was about or what, what was covered in that? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Black. Um, the Brace Group gets together about almost every uh, every quarter or so, and um, uh, one of the things on the agenda this month was kind of um, getting a, a community of practice um, set up online for the municipalities, uh, other interest groups will be able to access and see um, a variety of uh, information sharing from uh, across different jurisdictions um, in Canada. So that's that's one of the uh, um, one of the big items, and also there uh, we received a briefing from the um, New Brunswick. Um, um, the name is escaping me now. The name of the group that's uh, hosting the conference on the 18th of March, which we're also presenting at um, mm -hmm. uh, New Brunswick Environmental uh, Network. Sorry, <clears throat> so they're also hosting a conference on the 18th, which is going out across the province for uh, um, registration. So it was part of the um, the planning for uh, for that conference as well. And just just one more. Um, the meeting, uh, you had mentioned the, um, feasi the comprehensive engineering and feasibility study with NBDTI and, and NSTIR. Has that, has that happened yet? It has happened? And can you, can you tell us anything about that? Just Yeah, thank you, Councillor Black, again. Um, the mayor uh, alluded to this uh, earlier in the in the meeting. What the the presentation was held on uh, um, last Thursday um, at the Civic Center, and it was really it was a it was a public information meeting um, where the um, project manager from the New Brunswick Department of Transportation and Infrastructure was presenting an overview of the project, the project scope, who the successful proponent um, is that's undertaking the the work, which is Wood Environmental. Uh, a very, a very big, uh, big, big firm. They were also involved with the Petticodiac River, uh, River work. So DTI uh, facilitated the presentation, and it was really just uh, scope, timing, expectations, uh, potential deliverables, uh, and it was made very clear, as Worship noted, uh, noted earlier, that um, it's all about the trade corridor. And I guess the uh, our concerns were were raised at the at the meeting by uh, by His Worship himself about, you know, not. It's not just about the trade corridor for us. We have two uh, major communities on, on both ends, and um, so it'll be interesting to see how uh, how we play into the the, the consultation or uh, or as a major stakeholder as part of the uh, part of the overall project. So, again, that was the, really the the intent of the project, but we're uh, we're expecting them to be reaching out to to us as a municipality again soon as a as a stakeholder. And also, um, just to add, they, the consultant will be also uh, attending the Shignecto Climate Change Collaborative Meeting uh, next week. So we'll also have some time as a more regional group to talk a bit about um, the study. We don't know what that, that presentation will look like. I suspect it will be much the same as last Thursday, but it is good to have uh, at least a, a seat at the table. Thanks. Councillor Butcher. Thank you. I just have a quick question. It's in regards to the... Um, uh, the open house about civic life that was supposed to be on Feb February 13th and then we switched it because of the hospital rally. So it's now on the 24th, but I don't know what time it starts. 
It's running from 5.30 to 6.30. Yeah, so we'll be posting um, um, some social media posts here over the next few days to help get the um, get the message out. Thank you. Councillor Finney? Uh, Could you tell me who of staff were fortunate enough to attend the Adaptation Canada 2020 conference in Vancouver? Who was that? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Finney. I was the only uh, town staff representative to attend, and the conference registration, uh, the flight, the per diem, uh, everything except the hotel was actually covered by uh, Natural Resources Canada. I just want to say thank you for the complete report. This is the, the most information, I think, Council, I mean, as far as I've seen, that has received in relation to any conference attended to <coughs> by any of the staff that's gone on these, these different conferences, and I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. So, yes. Thank you, Worship. Um, I do have a motion. I move that Council adopt the Economic Development Incentive Program for commercial, industrial, and multiple, uh, multiple unit residential development as presented at the special meeting of Council on March 2nd, 2020. Moved by Councillor Michel, seconded by Deputy Mayor Aiken. Question? Question. Question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Councillor Michel, that's good. You're, you're good for that one, but you have new business as well. Thank you, Worship, under new business. Uh, this is just a follow-up to not only the letter and petition that we received from uh, property owners at the end of Fairfield Road, but um, also the presentation uh, had that presentation uh, last Monday, and um, I felt it was important that we get a. Uh, I, I know that it's not a um, uh, being something that we 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 want to assume at this point in time without getting more information and getting a better understanding of what it would cost uh, um, to do that. So I do have a motion in regards to obtaining some more information in regards to the cost of, of the work. Uh, I move that council request staff to provide for discussion at the April 6, 2020 special council meeting, the costs associated to complete the ditching, cutting back alders and scraping of road on the stretch of the Fairfield Road between the end of the pavement and the town boundary as presented by the Woodlot and camp owners in the area at the special council meeting on March 2nd, 2020. Moved by uh, Councillor Michaud, seconded by Councillor Finney. Motion is open for comment. I, uh, Council, Councillor Evans, please. Would like to speak um, against the motion. And I'm going to speak against it for three reasons. Uh, one has to do with process, one has to do with respect for roles, council vis-a-vis -vis staff, and the other is on its merits. As I've said on many occasions, I'm a big proponent of good processes. I believe good process to be as big a contributing factor to good outcomes as good people are, though ideally you can have both. Council has processes which we follow when we do our jobs to establish priorities and a supporting budget. Staff have processes which they employ when they do their jobs, and in this case in public works for maintaining town infrastructure. As we have already seen tonight with the paving contract and we saw earlier with the designated highway five-year plan, staff have a process by which they determine what needs to be done, where and when, to do the best job they can with the funds that we allocate to them to maintain our roads and the infrastructure beneath them. We have processes for the community grants which we recently allocated uh, for our ca and for our capital projects where we consider at the same time all the options which compete for our scarce resources. We know the problems that occur when we make decisions on an ad hoc basis where the only thing we're considering is by definition the best thing. We have followed these processes and have established a balanced budget. This motion is asking staff to come up with the cost of doing a project. As has been said before, getting accurate figures takes staff time. And I would argue there's no point getting a precise dollar value if there's no budgeted funding to do the project. Why go to the effort of getting a price if we're not going to do the work? 
For to do the work, we would have to not do something that we've established as a priority and provided funding for. Uh, okay. This kind of ad hoc behavior flies in the face of best practices. If members of council want to make this a priority, then bring it up during a planning session in the fall and see if it makes the cut when it's considered with all the other proposals. Regarding roles, council establishes priority and staff operationalize them. Or, as it has been said, staff rows while council steers. I think that council is getting awfully close to rowing in this case. Staff have a list of all the roads that the town maintains and has prioritized the type and timing of maintenance they require. This is their job, not ours. But simply on the merits of this proposal, I am also against it. We have a request from people who own land which they acquired knowing it was on a road that was not maintained to town standards and now they want improvements, which no doubt would be good for them and increase the value of their asset. I understand that, and in their position, I would have signed the, position, the petition too. But our job as councillors is to do what is in the best interest of the whole municipality. In this context, we know that there are people who have homes, not camps and woodlots, on town-maintained roads, which through deterioration are no longer up to our standards. Yet we cannot upgrade them this year because we are competing, because there are competing demands on our road maintenance budget, which are even greater. So faced with this choice between doing scheduled work on maintained roads to preserve value or doing work on roads we don't maintain to increase value, I think my decision is clear to me. I'll be voting against this motion. Councillor Evans. Any other? Councillor Tower, please. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail like he likes to do anyway. My only comment, I, I don't remember Council Michaud asking us to put that road on any, any job list this year. He's asking for the cost behind it so that if we wanted to look at next year, we have a dollar value. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm in favor of the motion um, because... Uh, only because of the final part, which is it's a, it's a wood lot road that has camps on it, and they, we have other roads, the same situation, and I really don't feel like us going out and building up those roads either. Thank you. Oops. Any other questions, comments? I'll call for the question. question. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? Nay. Okay, so pro was Councillor Michaud and Councillor Finney, and all others were uh, nay. Is that correct? Okay. So the council uh, motion is not carried. Okay, thank you. Councillor Michaud? Um, that is it. We go to uh, question period. Yes, Bruce Wark, uh, worktimes.com. Um, I just have three questions. One of them is a, a very technical one. It has to do with the exit 506 of work. Um, the province has agreed uh, to supply the money for that work. Is that all of the money that, that was allocated for that? In other words, the whole project will be able to go ahead. My understanding is that, that that's their percentage of the, of the total amount is what we've got approved. Is that okay. correct, Mr. Ackie? Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, you know, on your bylaw governing code of conduct, um, I'm wondering, uh, it's fairly strict on gifts and favors and things that might cause a conflict of interest. Several councillors here will be running for re-election I'm wondering if it will apply to campaign donations uh, because that's clearly something that could cause a conflict of interest. If you're running again, you're still a councillor, you're running for re-election. Does the code of conduct cover campaign donations? No, I don't believe it does. The, um, uh, there is no 
provincial statutory guide to that. Um, you can accept donations and you don't have to report them. I know. Under the provincial system. And uh, I remember when I ran for council that I took an ad out in the paper and said, uh, amount donated, zero. Uh, just so that people understood that I had not taken such a thing. But uh, there is nothing in the provincial legislation that requires that. And uh, they, I can't see our code applying to the election period because it wouldn't apply to non councillors. So, so I don't see it as effective doing that. That will be an issue, I think, during the campaign, the requiring people to declare uh, their campaign donations, I think. And uh, I thought of the code of conduct. Uh, I mean, it's pretty clear that that could be a conflict of interest. And finally, um, I'm wondering about the economic development incentive plan. Um, my understanding of it was that it would apply only to uh, projects that wouldn't be going ahead otherwise. So I'm wondering if it could apply retroactively, say, to the recent JN Lafford Realty rezoning that the town approved uh, for that big uh, seniors complex and nursing home, whether that uh, economic development incentive plan could be applied to a project that is already going ahead, has been announced, yeah, such I, as that. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Burke, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Worship. Members of Council. Um, Bruce, thanks for the question. Um, yes, it absolutely can apply to, uh, to that development, because until such time as a building and development permit is issued, um, the project doesn't go ahead. So the, the whole program is, is based on the town a council approving uh, an application from a developer before a building development permit is issued. So to date, there's been no permit issued. The rezoning process um, has been completed, but the uh, developer is now um, uh, kind of putting their ducks in a row to get the project in a state of readiness in order to get a building permit uh, application ready. And at that time, they'd be, uh, they'd be okay to, to enter into discussions with the town uh, to work out an agreement, which would then come to council for, uh, for approval into the program. Oh, and you would approve the, each agreement individually? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So what the developer would have to do now is apply for the program? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? I move to adjourn. Uh, I hear a motion to adjourn. I hear a seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you.